Yes, also will be. Oh, yeah. Right, the, the, yeah, standing ability, yes. Yeah, all right, it'll be all right, though. I think they're. <coughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be fine. I mean, I, I the, the act of the play was predictable. Some people do just to keep you interested in the play. Some people do just to sort of be nervous or whatever. That is so what it is. That is so what it is. Good morning. My name is Rafael Espinal. I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you for attending today's hearing on Con Edison's outages that affected the city this summer. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, Councilmember Constantinidis, and Chair of the Waterfronts and Resiliency Committee, Councilmember Brennan. We're also joined by my colleagues from the Confum Consumer Affairs Committee. We have Councilmember uh, Ku, we have Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Lander. Uh, with that said, today our three committees will be hearing directly from Con Edison on why the city faced so many outages. To begin our hearing, I'd like to hand it over to Speaker Johnson to give the opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair Espinal. Thank you to Chairs Brandon and Constantinides and all the members that are here today. And thank you, Con Edison, for joining us. Electricity is a daily necessity that we use to power our transportation businesses, schools, medical facilities, and nearly every facet of daily life for New York City's 8.6 million people. When the power goes out in New York City, it not only causes severe economic hardship and tens of millions of dollars in losses, it can literally cost lives. And yet, New York City is regularly plagued by power outages, including several that occurred this summer, one of which coincided with a deadly heat wave. A power outage in this city translates to complete and utter chaos. It is unacceptable. It is unacceptable for adults and children alike to be trapped underground in subway cars or elevators in complete darkness. It is unacceptable for the city's multi-billion dollar economy, one of the largest economies in the world, to ground to a halt because of entirely preventable equipment failures. It is unacceptable for, for civilians to have to direct traffic because all the lights are out. It is unacceptable for residents and restaurants alike to throw out thousands and thousands of dollars worth of food. And it is completely unacceptable for the vulnerable among us to have their lives put at risk because they cannot turn on their air conditioning unit or leave their apartment. And yet, that is exactly what happened this summer. First, on July 13th, a massive power outage plunged Manhattan's west side into darkness, stretching all the way from 72nd Street to the West 40s and from Fifth Avenue to the Hudson River. Subway service was impacted as multiple lines simply stopped running and people were stuck in subway cars and elevators. On Broadway, shows were canceled, as were performances at Madison Square Garden and Lincoln Center. Restaurants were forced to close their, on their busiest week, uh, close on their busiest day of the week because they simply couldn't serve their customers. This outage was followed by another that left thousands of customers in Staten Island without power, in some cases for as long as 12 hours. During that same week, intense rain and sweltering heat led to underground wires overheating, causing several manhole fires across Queens and Brooklyn. The fires led to the loss of power and the evacuation of several buildings due to high carbon monoxide readings. Similarly, a failed feeder cable caused a power failure in the Bronx. Then came the heat wave over the July 20th weekend. The Weather Service issued heat advisories for numerous regions. And in New York City, the heat index was expected to reach up to 115 degrees. 
In the early evening of Sunday, July 21st, 2019, as temperatures rose to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, parts of New York City began losing power. The worst hit boroughs were Queens and Brooklyn, although outages were also reported in Manhattan, the Bronx, and on Staten Island. Yet prior to the heat wave, the president of Con Edison, Tim Colley, reassured, I don't know where he is today, reassured New Yorkers that Con Ed was, quote, ready for what the heat would bring. Ready for what the heat will bring, he said. According to Mr. Colley, Con Ed had learned from previous peak demand events and they were fully prepared, he said. During his press conference, Mr. Colley stated that Con Ed, quote, basically spends a full year preparing for the high demand that summer brings, end quote. And over the past year, they invested $1.5 billion in their energy delivery systems. Unfortunately for us, for many New Yorkers, for the city, Mr. Colley grossly overestimated Con Ed's capabilities. Con Ed intentionally cut power to seven Brooklyn neighborhoods and reduced the power output in others. On the hottest day of the year, Con Ed cut power to 30,000 customers in Canarsie, Mill Basin, and Flatbush and reduced voltage in Prospect Leverett's Gardens, Prospect Heights, Flatlands, Bergen Beach, and Georgetown. Of these neighborhoods, Canarsie and Flatlands rank four out of five on the city's heat vulnerability index, making these neighborhoods especially at risk during and after extreme heat events. Canarsie and Flatlands are majority black and immigrant neighborhoods. And although African Americans make up less than a quarter of New York City's population as a whole, they accounted for almost half of the hundred or more heat fatalities each year in the city between 2000 and 2012. Indeed, of those inf affected by the recent outages in Brooklyn, 63% were black. New Yorkers pay some of the highest prices for electricity. 43% more than the national average, to be exact. And these rates are only expected to go up as Con Ed is currently seeking a rate increase of 8.6% and 14.5% for electricity and gas, respectively. These are shocking numbers. And yet somehow Con Ed has been able to pay out increased dividends to shareholders for 45 consecutive years. It is the only utility on the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index that has been able to do that. I think New Yorkers are getting a raw deal. We pay more for, electrical, for, for an electrical power system that is poorly maintained and fails frequently. With the realities of climate change upon us, New Yorkers need a public utility that not only can meet our current needs, but can withstand a future that will likely be fraught with more frequent storms, heat waves, and other extreme weather events. We are here today to hear directly from Con Ed. We want to know why their confident predictions about the grid's ability to meet demand were completely erroneous. We also want to know what the company is doing to address system systemic infrastructure problems in our electrical power system. We need to hear today what steps Con Ed is taking to invest in research and de design solutions that will ensure our power system is reliable, affordable, resilient to climate change, and accommodating to new renewable energy sources. I look forward to receiving a comprehensive and thorough response from Con Ed this morning. I want to thank you uh, for all the members that are here today, again, to the chairs, and I now pass it back over to the chair of our Consumer and Businesses Licensing Committee, Council Member and Chair Rafael Espinel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As highlighted by the speaker, despite all of the techno technological advancements in recent years, particularly in the renewable energy sector, power outages still seem to be common occurrences in major and urban cities. It is confounding to me that in 2019, New York City, with its, with its multi-billion dollar economy, is still being grounded to a halt by what appear to be entirely avoidable equipment failures. More concerning is that these outages repeatedly occur during extreme weather events, particularly during heat waves. Losing power during hot spells poses a serious threat to people's lives. Across the country, more people die from heat waves each year than from all other extreme weather events combined. With an average temperatures increasing each year, reliable access to cooling devices is essential. Across the five boroughs, the neighborhoods particularly vulnerable to heat stress are home to black and brown communities. I'm particularly concerned about the intentional outages that occurred in Southeast Brooklyn, 
which, which covers areas in or near my district. The experts we consulted have told us that it is, it is extremely rare for five cables to fail at once, as they did in Brooklyn on July 21st, and that the industry standard is, te is to test cables on an annual basis. Such tests should reveal whether such cables are failing. Clearly, someone at Con Ed was not doing their job, thereby endangering the lives of some of the most heat vulnerable communities in New York City. I'm also concerned that as an elected official, there was no communication from Con Ed to our offices in order to assist us with responding to constituent inquiries. The lack of communication and accountability on behalf of Con Ed is unacceptable. The city deserves better, and we need concrete answers from Con Ed on how it plans to properly serve and prioritize New York City residents, not its shareholders. Con Ed needs to regain the trust of New Yorkers by providing thorough responses explaining the causes of the outages and how Con Ed plans to own not only to prevent future outages, but how it, how it is prepared for the realities of climate change. New Yorkers must have confidence in their public utility as we face the realities and challenges of global warming. I look forward to hearing from Con Ed. Before I hand it over to my co-chairs, I want to thank the Consumer Affairs Committee staff for putting together this hearing, Senior Counsel Valkis Mahirig, Policy Analyst Leah Skip Skipererik, and my office staff, Legislative Director Caitlin Kalmar, as well as the staff on the Environmental Protection Committee and the Resiliency and Water Friends Committee. I would like now to invite my fellow committee chairs to make a statement. Chair Constantinidis. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Espinal. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and, and my colleague, uh, Chair Brannon, as well. Uh, my name is Costa Constantinidis. I'm chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and you know, I'm glad to be joining this hearing on the service outages this summer. Um, despite the remarkable profits noted by our speaker uh, this morning, Con Edison explicitly mentions the desire for an even higher rate of return on equity as part of the reason they are requesting additional rate increases beyond what are some of the most highest in the nation. Con Edison charges ratepayers for membership in trade associations, trade associations that directly fund the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, anti-climate science lobbying efforts across the nation. And all the while, our city's electrical grid continues to rot. And the speaker talked about the outages in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Queens. I know in my particular district, uh, I take umbrage with Con Edison calling me this past week asking to follow up about this hearing and yet could not get me on, the, I could not get anyone from Con Edison consistently on the phone during the outages in my community. Uh, in real time, I would have to get phone calls from constituents letting me know that they were out. And then I would get a phone call from Con Edison saying, well, they'll be back on by end of day. End of day is not a good estimate. And end of day doesn't help those business owners. End of day doesn't help those constituents who need to have relief. Uh, in view of the bl recent blackouts and impacts of climate change, reliability of our electricity system is a key concern for New Yorkers. However, the models currently used to predict future electricity uh, do not meet the demand and do not understand what's really going on. The New, York, the New York ISO does not consider social justice concerns, including the, the continued use of fossil fuels and the resultant poor air quality. The fossil fuel plants that the ISO runs for 15% of the time do not address New York City's need uh, for clean energy mandates. Uh, battery storage could be cleaner and more effective than the new gas peaker plants. There are plenty of things that we need to do better and move to renewable energy future. Uh, new York City is the largest city in the United States can act as a global leader by both converting to an ecologically, socially, and an econ an economic, uh, economically regenerative and economic, eh, economy expeditiously, and by leading a transition to renewable energy generation and battery storage but we cannot rely on this old business model. While scientists expect the Earth to be warmer 100 years from now than it is today, and every year it's been warmer, and last year it's, it rained more than uh, we've seen in, in decades, there's a wide range in how much warming uh, the Earth will experience. The choices we make now matter. We need to transition to renewable energy, and we need to have a, a power supplier that is worried less about profits and more about the people that they serve. And frankly, I join uh, with many of my colleagues who, who say that if, uh, if Con Edison's not up for the job, then we need to find someone else. So I want to thank our committee staff, 
Sarah uh, Swanston, our counsel, policy analysts Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chola, financial analyst Jonathan Seltzer, my legislative director and counsel Nicholas Wazowski, along with the staff of the Consumer Affairs and Resilience and Committee for their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Constantinides. Up next, I want to call uh, Chairman Justin Brannan. Thank you, Chair Espinal. Uh, I join Speaker Johnson in welcoming you to this joint oversight hearing to discuss uh, Con Ed's summer 2019 power outages. My name is Justin Brannan. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. Uh, I want to again extend my thanks to the Speaker, Councilmember Espinal, who chairs the Committee on Consumer Affairs, and Const uh, Council Member Constantinidis, who chairs the Committee on Environmental Protection. July uh, 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded in human history. Because of climate change, temperatures have been rising more rapidly over the past century, and New York City is expected to experience more frequent and longer lasting heat waves. By 2050, the frequency of heat waves is expected to triple. Because of the urban heat island effect, which makes urban areas much hotter, and surrounding non-urban areas. Average city temperatures can be 1.8 to 5.4 degrees hotter during the day and 22 degrees hotter at night. New Yorkers just depend on a reliable source of electricity. When the electrical system fails, that puts everyone in the city at significant risk of heat-related illnesses, including dehydration, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Coastal flooding exacerbated by climate change will also put significant pressure on the grid. We saw this during Superstorm Sandy. Five major electrical transmission substations in the city were flooded during Sandy and shut down, and one-third of the city's electric generating capacity was temporarily lost. By the 2050s, 97 percent of the city's current power generation will be located within the 100-year floodplain, making more of the city's power susceptible to severe flooding and outages. But with everything we know, we still do not know how Con Ed will mitigate the risks of climate change and ensure that its equipment and systems are resilient to the impacts of storm surge, coastal flooding, and heat waves, among others. As part of its 2014 settlement with the Public Service Commission, Con Ed agreed to produce a climate change vulnerability study which would assess how more frequent and intense heat waves, wind, and other extreme weather will affect the city's electrical grid and Con Ed's operations in the long term. In 2015, Con Ed promised the Public Service Commission it would publish the entire report by 2018. That did not happen. Con Ed now indicates it will be published sometime this year. We do know that Con Ed has identified heat waves as a main area of concern for the network system and that by 2050, because of climate change, system peak loads will be 13 to 24 percent higher and underground electric power equipment will have higher failure rates during heat waves. Although Con Ed has raised its substations and generating facilities to the FEMA flood level plus three feet to be more resilient to coastal surge and flooding, it is not clear what adaptations measures Con Ed plans to implement to address the future effects of heat or whether FEMA plus three is sufficient. I look forward to hearing Con Ed's testimony and answering our questions about current and planned efforts to make the city's electrical infrastructure more resilient to the effects of climate change. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, policy analyst Patrick Mulville, financial analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor Jonathan Yedin, and council staff from the Consumer Affairs and Environmental Protection Committees for all their hard work in putting this, today's important hearing together. Chair Espinal, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brennan. We are also joined by the public advocate who would like to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Chair Espinal. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairs uh, Brennan and Constantinidis, as well as the speaker, for holding this. Uh, I'm just as concerned as the 8.5 million people uh, here in New York City about the uh, blackout and Con Edison's uh, issues around uh, definitely transparency and in infrastructure, but also communication. Uh, as was mentioned on July 21st, uh, there was the blackout in Brooklyn. The first press release put out by Con Edison announced that the company was responding to multiple outages. Two and a half hours later at 11 p.m., the second press release put out the company stated that the blackout was an intentional preemptive move to protect vital equipment. 
I am thankful that Conant allowed me to uh, visit their Brooklyn Command Center uh, and a few days later. Uh, when we asked about the conflicting nature of these statements, Con Edison seemed to be completely unaware of the conflict. Uh, there are a billion dollars of profits. We're still asking where $695 million of uh, infrastructure spending went to. In the hours leading to the outage, my office also found out that one of the feeders was offline for regular maintenance. As the temperature remained high and demand on the grid began to rise, voltage in the area was reduced to mitigate the impact of this increased demand. Soon, one of the feeder cables malfunctioned, shifting the burden to the remaining feeders and subsequently leading to a chain of failures. After the fourth failure, the Corporate Emergency Response Center, which includes Con Edison leadership, Public Service Commission, PSC representation, and the New York City Emergency Management Office was put on direct notice at the potential for the blackout shortly after a fifth and final feeder failed. My office was informed that after this moment, Con Edison leadership had approximately five minutes to make the call to depower the grid to prevent a power cat catastrophic outage. After that call was made, there was approximately, according to Con Edison staff, between 20 minutes and an hour and a half between when the call to de-energize de the network was made and the blackout itself. These vital minutes could have been used to warn the public about what was going on, what was happening, especially vulnerable citizens like my aunt and uncle who spent the night, uh, my aunts who spent the night putting ice packages as much as possible on my uncle who was uh, bedridden. Vulnerable citizens such as those dependent on electrical medical equipment or people with low mobility who may need to seek a cooling center. When my office asked Connison about outreach policy for blackouts, the company admitted it currently has no policy, quote unquote, to communicate with customers. How can it be that customers are not notified ahead of time? And how can it be that with the clear build up of failures and with Con Edison leadership, the PSC, and NYCEM in the room, there was conflicting public statements released to the public during the blackout? Who was directly responsible? Uh, we did reach out, uh, we did do some research on others in the country, LA, by the way, which has a public system, um, doesn't seem to have the same kind of feeder failures that I was told uh, was quite regular. And I'm concerned of whether this is regular or not. Having no policy is simply unacceptable. The fact that no outreach was made to even the most vulnerable members of the community, such as seniors and people with disabilities, is unconscionable and is a miracle that nobody was harmed. But I am thankful they were not. To date, my office sent two letters to Con Edison and made two visits to the Con Edison and Brooklyn Command Center. While I appreciate Con Edison's response explaining his process of restoring power outages, I have yet to get assurance that these catastrophic communications failures was a fluke. Moreover, I'm still concerned, I'm still unclear of its future communications plan if a similar incident were to happen again in New York City. I sincerely hope this hearing will help quell these concerns as well as uh, the concerns about what happened in New York City, uh, particularly when there was money sent there to fix uh, the issues that happened uh, in the city blackout. In the coming days, I'll be working on legislation to improve communication transparency during the blackout and hold the company accountable. Again, I thank the council committees for hosting these hearings today. Uh, if Con Edison is unable to answer these questions, at some point we do have to figure if whether Con Edison is the one that should be running this. I know there's a discussion around whether it should be public. I know that takes a lot of time, so my hope is that the state just begins a process in case that's the direction we need to go in. Thank you so much for the time and thank you for the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, before I move forward, I just want to do some housekeeping. Uh, we also have been joined by Carmen Yeager from Brooklyn, Steve Levin from Brooklyn, Kevin Koslowitz from Queens, Debbie Rose from Staten Island, Antonio Reynoso from Brooklyn. Uh, we have Keith Powers from Manhattan. Uh, we have Farrah Lewis from Brooklyn and Donovan Richards from Queens as well. Uh, with that said, uh, the first panel that's up, we have Kyle Kimball from Con Edison, Stephen Parisi from Con Edison, David DeSanti from Con Edison. May you all please raise your right hand to take an oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank, Thank you. you. With that said, we're gonna hand it over to Speaker Johnson. Oh, you're more than welcome to begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, Chairman Constantinides, Brannon, Espinall, and members of the City Council for the opportunity to discuss the customer outages associated with the July heat wave and the West 65th Street substation. My name is David DeSanti. I'm the Con Edison, I'm Con Edison Vice President of Brooklyn Queens Electric Operations. I am joined by Stephen Parisi, Vice President of Central Engineering, and Kyle Kimball, the Vice President of Government, Regional, and Community Affairs. 
Our comments will focus on what caused these two events, our response, and the actions we are taking to further enhance the reliability of our electric grid. Before I begin my remarks on the events themselves, I'd like to say that we understand the frustration customers expressed and fully realize that being without power causes distress. I assure you that all of our 14,000 women and men take pride in providing reliable service. I worked for the company for 32 years, and, I'm, and more than, other than safety, nothing is a higher priority for me than reliable service. Following the outages in Southeast Brooklyn, we sent notes of apology to customers because we know they deserve better. We also extended the deadline for customers to submit claims for losses they incurred due to those outages. I want to make it clear that the outages from the heat wave and those in the west side of Manhattan were not the result of neglected equipment or lack of investment and in maintenance. We have an intensive capital planning process and invest heavily in our systems to maintain high levels of reliability. We use a targeted investment strategy that considers the performance history of equipment as well as the forecasted demand on each component. Con Edison's electric delivery system is one of the most technologically advanced and complex in the world and contains redundancies to keep service reliable. Let me provide some details on the outages that affected the customers in Southeast Brooklyn during the July 19th to 22nd heat wave. I'll start with the evening of Sunday, July 21st, when circumstances demanded that we preemptively interrupt service. That decision, decision was driven strictly by fast-changing system conditions made with input from highly trained engineers and operators and implemented to prevent broader, more prolonged outages. To better understand our decision, it helps to first understand a little bit about our system. This area of Southeast Brooklyn has 19 feeder cables that serve 132,000 customers. An underground network system provides power to about 99,000 of these customers. The remaining 33,000 or so are served by a separate overhead 4KV grid. We design our system with redundancy so that when one feeder fails, customers do not lose service. That's because the power that the failed feeder was carrying is redistributed down to the feeders that remain in service. This shift places a greater burden on the in-service feeders, and when multiple feeder failures occur, this additional burden exponentially increases the likelihood of more failures. In our industry, this rapid sequence of feeder failures is referred to as cascading. This is what is, we sought to prevent by proactively shutting down the 4KV grid. Our preparations for the heat began days in advance. Our Friday, uh, on Friday morning, July 19th, we activated our Corporate Emergency Response Center, or CERC. Our CERC serves as our command post and brings together people and resources from across the company with the single objective of providing safe, reliable service during severe weather and other emergencies. In addition, we mobilized 4,000 employees, procured mutual assistance, pre-positioned emergency generators, and ensured that we had dry ice to distribute. Our system performed well on Friday and Saturday and into the early afternoon on Sunday. Sunday was the third straight day of temperatures above 90 degrees and the sustained heat resulted in high power demand for power. In fact, demand in New York City and Westchester County reached 12,063 megawatts, an all-time high for the weekend. Because the heat wave spanned the weekend, the demand was particularly heavy in residential areas such as Southeast Brooklyn. After several of the 19 feeder cables serving Southeast Brooklyn failed by early Sunday evening, we followed well-established protocols by making customer appeals and reduced the voltage by 5%, then by 8% to reduce strain on the system. Despite these measures, additional feeder cables serving the Southeast Brooklyn grid began to fail in relatively rapid succession, and ultimately six of the 19 feeders failed. The network normally served by 19 feeders was now being served by 13, each of which was heavily loaded due to the high demand inherently, inherently associated with the heat wave and the demand that shifted from the failed feeders. It was clear that allowing the grid to run with the six feeders out of service would result in cascading failures, extensive equipment damage, and broader prolonged outages. As a result, at 7.32 p.m., we preemptively interrupted service to 30,000 customers in the 4KV grid affecting people in the neighborhoods of Canarsie, Flatlands, Mill Basin, Old Mill Basin, Bergen Beach, Georgetown, and Marine Park. Because conditions were dynamic and events were moving so quickly, there was not time for us to alert customers before the shutdown of the equipment. The decision and the actual shutdown took place within minutes of each other. We made the decision in the presence of representatives of New York City Emergency Management who were embedded in our CERC giving them a real-time flow of information as to what was taking place and how we were responding. 
We understand the importance of communicating with customers and are working with agencies, including NYC Emergency Management, on ways to improve our communication during outages. Our decision to preemptively interrupt customers was correct for several reasons. The analysis by our engineers and operators made it clear that if we took no action, additional equipment was going to fail. It would have taken longer to repair and, more extensive dam and, and resulted in more extensive damage, meaning customers would have been without power for longer. Our action also prevented more widespread impact as service interruptions would have reached an additional 99,000 customers in Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, Prospect Lefferts Gardens, Prospect Park South, and Flatbush. It is important to note that the customers whose service was affected were going to lose power regardless. Our decision to de-energize our equipment did not cause more customers to be without power. I assure you that we fully appreciate the impact of shutting off powers to customers. We did not take this decision lightly and we appreciate that the action had a real and significant impact on people, particularly those who are elderly or on life-sustaining equipment. We always regret having customers out of service. When customers are out of service, our crews work round the clock to make restoration. As is often the case, the heat wave was broken by severe, thunder, by severe storms, which arrived late Monday afternoon, causing additional outages. By midnight Sunday, we had restored 55% of those affected by the preemptive interruption, and within 24 hours had restored service to nearly 95% of those in Southeast Brooklyn affected by the Sunday outage. Customers had several ways to stay informed on the status of outages, text or phone call, and by visiting our website and outage map. We also notified elected officials and kept them appraised throughout the event and were in regular touch with the media. Our outreach included deployment of customer service vans and personnel at Jacob Jaffe Fields in Flatlands and near Seaview Park in Canarsie. We distributed dry ice at both locations and had customer assistance personnel available to provide information on outage status give claim forms to customers and answer questions. In meetings with elected officials since this event, we have gotten back, um, we've gotten feedback that these were not optimal locations. We will work with stakeholders to identify better sites. The events in Southeast Brooklyn occurred despite our investment of more than $200 million in our grid in the area during the past decade. System-wide, we have invested more than $1 billion a year, $1 billion a year in our system since 2005 and at least $1.5 billion each year since 2015. While no utility's electric delivery system is fully immune from outages, Condison does strive to be as reliable as possible, and a number of metrics show we are the most reliable electric delivery company in the United States. In terms of outage frequency, we are about eight times more reliable than the average electric utility both in New York State and nationally. Additionally, over the last five years, heat-related outages to customers served by overhead lines have declined. We seek continuous improvement. We learn from every incident and every success. New York is the greatest city in the world and our customers deserve the most reliable electric service. We take that charge seriously. We have completed repairs to the 4KV, 4KV grid. In addition, we are finalizing plans for significant upgrades in Southeast Brooklyn. These improvements will include replacing 70 sections of underground cable serving the network and 25 sections of overhead cable within the 4KV grid itself. Installation of new switches on the overhead and underground systems to automatically isolate faults and reduce outages and allow for faster restoration when outages do occur. And we, we intend to complete the deployment of smart meters in this area by year end. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Steve, who will talk about the outage on the west side of Manhattan. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to the council for the opportunity to speak. The outage on the west side of the on the evening of July 13th was due to the incorrect operation of protective relays on transformers at a substation on West 65th Street following a fault on a 13 kV cable. Relays are the brains of our system. They make decisions in milliseconds to protect the grid when faults occur. Our first priority was to safely and quickly restore customers, so we immediately mobilized our corporate emergency response center and communicated that we would restore all customers by midnight. Uh, we met that target and restored our customers in an average of three hours and 10 minutes. We worked with New York City Emergency Management on site to keep the public up to date and on our response. Following restoration, our planners and operators began analyzing data and equipment performance. We also conducted diagnostic testing to identify the specific cause of this event. Within 48 hours, we announced preliminary findings 
and on July 29th, we announced our preliminary findings. We were announced the root cause was an improper connection between some of the sensors and the protective relays at the West 65th Street substation. This connection caused the protective relays to improperly shut down transmission feeders supplied from the West 49th Street station to West 65th and several other substations that also serve the area. Since this event, we have taken preventative measures by isolating similar relay equipment at other substations, and we are analyzing and testing before they are placed back into service. Although we are confident that we have identified the root cause of the west side outage and taken actions to prevent reoccurrence, we continue to conduct an in-depth review of the event. In addition to this ongoing review, there is an event analysis process underway with the New York Independent System Operator, the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Also, we are providing information to the New York State Public Service Commission in its investigation of this outage. In closing, I'd like to again emphasize our commitment to safety and reliability. We back that commitment with strategic capital planning and robust investment in our energy systems. The events in Southeast Brooklyn and on the west side of Manhattan happened because Despite our strategic targeted investments, our system is not perfect. They did not occur because of neglected infrastructure or a lack of maintenance or investment. Our decision to interrupt service in the Southeast Brooklyn on the evening of July 21st, while understandably frustrating for customers and puzzling to some, was due to the system conditions and not any other factor. We remain convinced that it helped avoid a large scale outage that would have stretched on for several days. That concludes our prepared remarks, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to uh, start with uh, some questions. Uh, in the lead up to the heat wave weekend, as I mentioned in my opening statement, your president, Tim Colley, assured reporters that Con Ed was, quote, ready for what the heat will bring. In retrospect, this was clearly a mischaracterization of the situation. Can you explain why he mischaracterized the situation? Yes, uh, I wouldn't say mischaracterize the situation. Uh, you think you were ready? We, we were, yes. So that's what ready looks like? The outcomes are the outcomes, sir. We, we do everything we can to get ready. Uh, I would refer you, you talk about our reliability. I would refer you to the chart on the, on the last page of the handout, and it, and it discusses our reliability with regard to our peer group. If you look at, if you look at the chart, it references uh, outages um, across the, uh, the nation in different uh, service territories. So nationally and in New York State, in New York State, for instance, uh, the outage rate, and it's per thousand, it's about a thousand customers per thousand would expect to be out of service in a given year, meaning all customers would experience at least one outage. If you move over to Con Edison's overhead system, um, we expect about 398 um, customers per thousand to be out of service. Uh, down at our network system, the experience is down to about 20 per thousand. Uh, and our blended rate, our system is about 75% underground, 25% overhead. It's about uh, 120 per thousand. So next time Tim Colley tells the public that we are ready for what the heat will bring, the outcomes are the outcomes. As you just said. No, sir. We mobilized 4,000 people. We get ready. But so you, what, what happened, cities. that he characterized it as Con Ed is ready. And that, I detailed exactly what happened after he said that. Day by day, hour by hour, neighborhood by neighborhood, borough by borough. So nope. it, do you think that the public should feel assured that when your president stands up in front of reporters and says, we are ready for this weekend, and then that's what happens, that the public should feel safe and assured by the top official from Con Edison, giving them the, that assurance ahead of time? I think if you look at the reliability statistics, the idea, so we do, uh, we do two things. One, every year we do an extensive capital planning process to get ready for the summer. So you take the lessons learned from the, the previous summer, you make investments in the system to deal with whatever issues arose. If you have areas that had multiple outages, you go in and figure out um, what you need to do differently in those different neighborhoods. And so when someone says we are ready, that's based on one, everything we identified in the previous year that needed to be done in the capital, in the capital uh, project process. And we completed all those repairs, made any uh, re re resiliency investments we needed to make based on uh, our 
our capital plan. And then, of course, if you look at the reliability statistics, you know, if you are in the network system, the chances of you being interrupted are very, very low. Um, and they are higher in the overhead system, but still relatively low compared to the state and the national average. So the idea is when someone says that we are prepared, it means that the best we can see based on the information that we have, we have done what we needed to do to get ready for this system. It doesn't mean the system is foolproof. Did he say that? The way you just explained it, did he say that to the public ahead of time? Did he explain it that way? I, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, I'm just taking the words that you're quoting. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm The way you just explain explained it. it, giving that context to the public, and uh, putting on uh, some conditions, I don't think Kali explained it that way. Okay. He explained it, he, the quote that I read is what he said to the public. I, sir, I think what he meant by his quote was, we are as ready as we could possibly be in terms of summer prep, getting ready with load relief programs, maintenance programs, inspection programs, and having our workforce on 12-hour shifts ready to go to respond to emergencies. Well, Con Ed emergencies claims- Emergencies are going to happen on electrical systems when they run at peak. It happens in New York City and in every other major city. Con Ed claims that it recently spent $1.5 billion to upgrade the electric grid. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, but experts claim that these investments were largely spent on routine maintenance that are needed to ke simply keep the grid working. Can you please tell us more about your preventive maintenance program? Yes. Um, so we have a, uh, an inspection process. We, we work out with the Public Service Commission where we, ins we routinely uh, inspect our service boxes and equipment uh, across a five-year cycle. We also have a, um, an investment uh, program. We, um, we essentially look at, um, we forecast new, new business coming onto the system, new buildings. We put that into our forecast for uh, our one-year, five-year, and, and five-year programs. We also look at, um, as soon as the summer's over, we look at the experience from the prior summer, we look at how the load developed, and we, uh, we basically um, put together a load relief plan uh, to invest prior to next, next summer. Prior to the summer uh, period, we make uh, any necessary repairs we can to get banks back on cert online, uh, repair open mains, and get ready for the coming load. Con had claimed that the large blackout on the west side of Manhattan was caused by a failed protection system or relay. You just talked about that in your testimony. Industry standards dictate that protection systems are tested when they are commissioned, then are regularly tested thereafter as part of a preventative maintenance program. When was the protection system or relay that failed in Manhattan last tested before the failure? So the, uh, the system that operated, was installed in 2008. Uh, those relay systems are tested every five years. Uh, I don't have the exact date, but all you of our- You should have the exact date. That is a very key question that the public should know the answer to. When was the last test? What do you mean you, you are in charge of this? You're here today to speak on it, and you can't tell me the last time that system was tested? You don't have a date? I do not. I'm not in you front guys of me at the moment. Did you look into that as part of the- yes. Okay, so you looked into it. How come you don't have the information? You came here today without an answer to when the last time that was tested? That's unacceptable. We were also told by experts that there are always redundant protections installed. So if one relay fails, another should kick in. Are there redundant protections for Con Ed feeders? Yes, there are. Why did they fail then? So they didn't, the, the, the relay that operated was on a transformer that operated incorrectly for a distribution feeder fault. The relay that operates for the transformer supply is intended to look only at the transformer. Because of problems with the wiring connection from the current transformers and the sensors within the transformer, it misoperated and saw the distribution feeder fault, which it's not intended to do. The feeder itself has a relay and a backup relay. Both the primary relay operated for the distribution feeder Again, the transformer relay operated when it should not have. Well, in the 2012 uh, raid case, Con Ed requested $26 million for upgrades to, subway sta to substation relays. Then, according to subsequent capital expenditures, $3 million was budgeted and zero was spent. There was a similar instance in 2016 when a million dollars was requested and budgeted for relay protection communication upgrades, but again, 
your public filings show zero was spent. What happened to this money and why was it not spent on the upgrades that were deemed necessary? So over the past 10 years, we've spent an average of $21 million on relay and communication system upgrades uh, through different uh, projects that are across the system. All of those funds are targeted at, re at upgrading relay systems, investing in technology, getting higher performance at the installed systems, and retiring some equipment that has aged out. Um, so uh, the program lines might be called different things, but the total spend is $21 million just for the last 10 years, certainly spend before that. But this, the 2012 rate case, Con Ed requested $26 million for upgrades, but you're saying only $21 million was spent. In, your, in, your public filings said $26 million. Yes. So how come, how come $26 million wasn't spent? Yeah, I'm not sure where the shortage comes on that. In the same rate case filings in 2013, Con Ed indicated that 90% of its relays were of electromechanical variety, which are severely outdated and are more likely to result in outages. Is that correct? Uh, not outdated, no. Uh, electromechanical relays are used throughout the industry, uh, primarily at the area station level. Transmission level voltages, 138,345, are moving uh, more rapidly towards microprocessor-based relays. So a population in the area stations, uh, utility-wide, that's, that's not uncommon. Did the protection system that failed and allegedly caused the July 13th Manhattan blackout include electromechanical relays? So the relay itself is electromechanical. However, the sensor is, the wiring to the sensor is actually what misoperated. What, Re what relay, uh, relay was fine. The input voltages to it is the problem associated. What with percentage it. of Con Ed relays are electrical mechanical relays? Uh, currently about 80%. Uh, why haven't they been replaced? They, they, we will go through as, they, as required for us if there's upgrades needed, uh, if equipment is changed out. However, electromechanical relays provide adequate protection. So uh, industry standard dictates that cables should be tested regularly and insulation tests would normally indicate whether there are signs of degradation in a cable. Uh, in an interview, Mr. Colley stated that the five cables that failed in Brooklyn leading to the outages during the July 20th heat wave weekend, experts tell us that it's very rare for five cables to fail at once. It is more likely that Con Ed failed to conduct its regular testing or ignored the results in such tests. When were those cables last tested? And what were the results of those tests? The so, cables that failed. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's tests in the industry that are done occasionally with high pots. We conduct high pot testing on cables uh, if they meet certain criteria when they're returned to service. Um, we don't have a, 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 a high pot program where we take feeders out of service intentionally to, to test those feeders. Um, the science surrounding that shows that it really can't uh, predict, isn't predictive of a heat related thermal failure. Uh, so we don't do it for that, for that reason. So when was the last time those cables were tested? Um, I'd have to look at the records. Of how come, how come Con Ed comes here today with so we don't, these basic So we don't, again, they're not tested for the purpose of, of a thermal test. It's, uh, it's only when they're re under certain criteria, when they're returned to service, based on the characteristics of the fault at that time. So, so let me just give you some, some understanding of, uh, so you understand the breadth of, of the, uh, the issue here. So we have 65 uh, networks across the system served by about 1,600 uh, feeder cables. During the three-day heat period, we lost 46 feeders, 16 of them in the uh, peak period, six of them in this one network. So it was a very concentrated failure in this one network, and it was unique. In 2008, the Public Service Commission approved funding for your energy efficiency programs. In testimony from the New York Energy Consumers Council, as part of your current rate case, your company still has more than $100 million in unspent funds that were specifically earmarked for these programs. Can you explain this discrepancy? So there could, there could be a, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily aware of that specific discrepancy, but there could be a number of reasons um, that it doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to be spent or that it's not a priority. It's a huge priority for us. We have more money uh, in the rate case for energy efficiency. Um, I can't necessarily explain that specific discre 100 million. That was 11 years ago. 11 years ago, 
the PSC approved funding for your energy efficiency programs. And there is a current set aside amount of money in unspent funds of $100 million that was earmarked for these programs 11 years ago. It would be helpful to understand so why that is. The energy efficiency programs is typically break down into two pieces. Uh, one was where we, we work with NYSERDA and, and local folks to uh, distribute uh, LED light bulbs and so forth, which really reduce that, that, uh, that demand, that peak demand for, for power, which avoids us having to build additional plant, which can impact rates and certainly helps with the, uh, the carbon issue. Uh, the other piece of it is folks who subscribe for demand response programs, where we essentially pay them to, to turn off their equipment uh, during peak demand. Uh, we may, I, I have to look at the details, we may not have fully subscribed all those programs across that period of time. But that's not money we get to, to keep, so you understand. That's money that is directed toward that, those efforts. But it's money that could help customers. Yeah, and we, and it's, and like I said, it's not, if it's not spent, it doesn't mean that it's not a priority, that we're not continuing to spend. Um, it's a, it's a, a tremendous priority for us, and it's been extremely helpful in helping us meet some of the demand particularly in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, where we've had a lot of success. So an, uns an unspent balance, one, doesn't stay with us, and two, doesn't mean it's not a priority. It means for, for one reason or another, it just hasn't been spent. When and we're, or we may be under budget. When deciding which neighborhoods to cut or reduce power due during a heat wave, does Con Ed take into account the city's heat vulnerability index? No, we do not. Why not? Uh, operators, uh, operators really have to make uh, technical decisions. We, we're not, we don't track uh, customers by demographics. Uh, we, we really have to look uh, purely at the, the, uh, the engineering behind it and uh, make decisions based on, on that factual analysis. Are there some neighborhoods that have, have a higher concentration of older equipment? It's hard to say. We, we have a robust investment plan. This network in particular, uh, of the 65 networks I mentioned, um, if you look at the, the assets we've directed at it, it ranks eighth in, in spending in the last 10 years, so we have directed quite a bit of, uh, of capital dollars and maintenance dollars to this network. No, but that's a simple question. Are there some neighborhoods that have a higher concentration of older equipment that you should know that? Well, yes, but it's, it's yes. So what are those neighborhoods? I would say I don't know off the top of my hand. It, a lot of it would be... Would so all at, the questions that you don't know today so let that, me are, give you, that, that are I basic give questions you should know and we expect answers to, and I hope that today, given these are basic questions, these are not complicated questions, that's a pretty that Con Ed will come back to us later this afternoon with a written response of these questions that you've been unable to answer at this public setting, given that uh, 8.6 million people uh, rely on you all. Okay, so um, how does Ghana uh, prioritize where to upgrade equipment? We, we have a, a uh, for, for network reliability, we have a network reliability model, which looks at and uh, prioritizes the assets in that um, um, in, in that particular network, looks at the reliability data on all of the uh, cable and equipment. The underground um, system in Con Edison is quite large. It, it incorporates uh, 96,000 miles of uh, secondary and primary cables. Uh, we have characteristics, performance characteristics on all of it. We look at, uh, as I said, we look at new business load growth. We look at uh, demand. Um, that's moving around on the system, and we prepare a, uh, a, a, an investment plan to meet that. Uh, we've made consistent progress in the last 10 years using that reliability model, and have driven those numbers down. Yeah, can, I, can I just go back to the previous question on the, on the aging infrastructure? So I think it's very important to address this, because I think we should, should address this, because it's not necessarily a question, the way you've asked the question is not necessarily a question that is answerable in a concise format. This is a network system, and the system is only as good as its weakest counterpoint. And so we don't necessarily think of networks as areas that we can leave behind for, un for disinvestment, because the system doesn't work that way. It works as an entire organism, and you can't neglect one because that brings down the health of the entire organism. So there might be cables here and there around the system that are an older vintage, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are therefore failing or neglected, it means that they're working and we don't necessarily have to fix that. We can redirect our resources to somewhere else. So I just don't want that to go unanswered because it's not an aging infrastructure story because the, the network doesn't work if you have aging infrastructure. Are you all currently, uh, are you all still currently seeking, seeking a rate increase? We are. 
Witnesses testifying on behalf of the city during the current rate case have criticized Con Ed for focusing on maintenance and repairs as opposed to investing in research and development that would address design issues and modernize the grid in a manner that is more responsive to the city's needs. What is Con Ed doing to invest in research and development that would address some of the recurring issues as well as the inevitable increased demands on the electrical grid from climate change? So we're, we're doing a number of different studies. I'm work, actually working in the partnership with, uh, th this is a larger question, so I can, I can go on or I can answer it in different parts and different people's questions. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in terms of preparing for climate change, both from a resiliency standpoint of just the system itself, but also uh, work to get more renewable electrons into the system, as well as preparing for uh, the increased load as we electrify the system, because as we electrify the system, it's not lost on us that there's going to be more reliance on the system, uh, particularly as people pl replace uh, gas heating uh, with electric heating. So right now we are designed, as Dave mentioned, for a, about a 13,000 megawatt hour peak, um, and that is, uh, uh, with the recent legislation that's put, passed both here in the city and in the, at the state, you know, we estimate that that peak is going to go from 13,000 megawatts to nearly 40,000 megawatts, and we could become a winter peaking utility. We are currently a summer peaking utility. So there's a lot of different buckets that are going on. In, in, on, the, on the issue of resiliency, we are working very closely on the, uh, the climate vulnerability study that should be released, uh, as Councilman Brennan mentioned, at the end of this year. Um, that, that's something that's being discussed now and finalized. We're also working in, this, in the second category of preparations with um, the electric system itself. Uh, we're working with the city uh, and National Grid on a study with an outside consultant on what investments have to be made into the grid to meet the city's demand, and that's a study that will be done um, this next uh, spring. And then thirdly, there's a study coming out, and we're happy to brief, and all of these we're happy to sit with the council and brief staff, the council members, about the findings, because I think this is a very important conversation for us, um, this resiliency and, and preparation conversation, is there's a, a study we're doing with the uh, Energy um, Electric Reliability Institute um, that is focused on the technologies that, that are still needed. So one of the biggest problems is as we move to this renewable future is there are some still pretty significant technological gaps in terms of how people are actually going to be able to take te technologies into their homes and replace uh, fossil, fuel gener fossil fuel heating uh, with renewable heating, and so heat pumps and that sort of thing, but there's still some technological gaps. So we're working with, uh, we funded a study with EPRI um, that is looking at what are the technolo technology gaps that consumers are going to, that we need to overcome in order to have wide-scale electrification. So there's a number of different things going on in those three different categories that I could continue going on. Um, but essentially, we, we are looking at it in these three categories, working in partnership with the city, happy to work in more closely in partnership with the council on these important issues. It's estimated that the west side outage cost businesses tens of millions of dollars in losses. Governor Cuomo has stated that Con Ed will be expected to reimburse businesses for their losses. Does the company plan to do that? Yes, we are uh, currently um, uh, accepting uh, reimbursement, uh, uh, reimbursement applications for Brooklyn and for West Side, um, we extended the time. Um, there's been a lot of concern as our conversations over the last couple of weeks about the policy around receipts and and that thing. And I can sure, assure you that we're going to be fair. We can also let you know individually what kind of reimbursements we've seen in your respective districts. Are these losses covered up to 100 percent, or are there limits? There are some limits that I can. If you give me a second, I can. But are, there are some dollar limits. Um, yeah, those, those limits yeah. for uh, retail customers would be, uh, I believe it's $225 without receipts, just an itemized bill for uh, lost, uh, loss of food, um, $515 with an itemized, uh, uh, you know, with, with receipts. Uh, and for commercial business, it would be uh, $10,200 for, for losses related to... Uh, what if their person? losses are more than $10,000? Um, for like lost business, no, we don't we don't cover that. Well, that's really bad for those small businesses. We we all, all we understand that frustration. We understand the impact. Do you think that's fair? So we don't guarantee service. But right? do you think that's fair? We don't guarantee service. But do you think that's fair? The reimbursement policy is something we worked in close. So this is a function of the tariff we've set that we've negotiated with uh, the PSC. Um, so wh whether or not it's fair, I guess it's more that that's is, this is what we're allowed. You think it's to adequate? Do. 
I, for the for the business that is not able to, that needs have ten thousand dollars, no, I love more than ten thollars dollars. I'm sure it's not. Uh, why do New Yorkers pay some of the highest rates nationally, forty three percent than the national average, higher than the national average? So, so the infrastructure and uh, the, the what we have in uh, in the in the uh, inner city is really quite capital intensive. Uh, no one else has a network system uh, like Con Edison's. It requires significant capital investment. Um, and to do work and conduct any sort of work in the city is expensive. It's an expensive place to operate. It's an expensive place to uh, provide service. Conant has been reporting increased dividends for shareholders for the last 45 years consecutively. How is it possible with all the money needed? How is that possible with all of the money that's needed uh, on an aging infrastructure grid? So, so the money we direct, in fact, the, the rate increase we're asking for is, is not, not money to put in our pockets. It's, it's money to invest in the system. And we work with the Public Service Commission and other stakeholders on a plan, an investment plan, um, so that we can, we can effectively uh, provide uh, resilient, reliable. But you already have plenty of money. You're, you're giving big dividends to your shareholders. Year after year, mo you're the only. We've, prov you're the we've, only provided, we've provided modest, modest increases in dividends to, to keep our. Modest. Stock, modest increases in dividends to keep our, our stock attractive in, in the marketplace. Uh, we fund our utility uh, through stock and, and uh, borrowing, um, and that's about a 50 50 split. The, uh, the borrowing that we need to, to, to execute the capital plan. Um, all that borrowing, the interest rates does does go into rates, um, and the dividends we we pay to pay to the equity market is to to maintain that that funding. Okay, I'm going to finish here. I just have a couple more questions. I want to apologize to the colleagues for all these questions. In 2000, in the 2013 rate case, Conant agreed to carry out an assessment of climate risks to its grid. You just spoke about that, Kyle. Part of that 2013 rate case agreement included a reporting requirement. The first report was due in 2014. And the timeline has been adjusted multiple times. However, no parts of the report have been publicly released. How many parts of the report have been completed so far? We're waiting for more than five years. And when do you expect it to be publicly released? Uh, we expect it to be publicly released at the end of 2019. I don't think any chapters have been publicly released. There are some chapters that are being um, that are being shared with the the other um, stakeholders in the in the the other parties to the to the study. What's causing the delay? Um, there's 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 no particular. The first real real delay was that the the funding and even though we it was in our rate case, the funding for it was not necessarily approved until I believe it was 2017. Um, so that that it didn't really get started and in, in, in earnest until 2017. Why is five years not enough time? Why does it take so long? You guys have a lot of money, a lot of staff, a lot of expertise. Why do you think it's acceptable that it's taken this long for the public? I think what's going to be good is it's very, it's it's going to be a very good report that's going to address a lot of the issues, and it's also going to take into account a lot of the um, the, the changes that have happened within the last year. Um, Historically, heat waves impact the city's electric grid more frequently and more significantly than any type of weather event. As we witnessed this past July, the number of heat waves by 2050 is expected to triple. And ConEd projects the system peak loads by 2050 will be 13 to 24 percent higher than they currently are. What are ConEd's plans to provide reliable service when system demand is almost 25 percent more than what we witnessed in July? And what impact will that have on the rates that customers pay? We continue to invest in the system. We have a, a one, five, and 20-year uh, look-ahead plan. Um, we, we hope to be informed by the, the study, which will tell us what's, what's ahead with regard to electrification. Um, we think that will force, that will drive uh, continued investment in the system. We may at some point become a, a winter peaking utility. Um, we also intend our, our design criteria for our system um, incorporates what we call an 86 TV, which is our combined, uh, it, it's really the combined of the humidity and temperature at that time. It's about a, about 100 degree uh, temperature um, index. Um, and, and we're going to do a sensitivity study and see what that would look like if it went up a degree to 87. The experience in this heat wave was 86.9. We were, we, we were above design. And in fact, the load in some of our networks was slightly above forecast as related to that. 
Um, that, that study we'll, we'll talk about and point toward that, that continued capital investment. At that point, we would, we would talk with, uh, speak with our regulators and, and other stakeholders about the, uh, the best use for marginal dollars. Is, it, is the idea to invest heavier in, in our system or should we pursue, pursue alternatives such as uh, further investments in uh, energy efficiency and demand side management? Uh, Con Ed, I, I think, is a very opaque organization. Very, you know, there's not much transparency. You can't glean much from the public filings. We have to rely upon the testimony that's presented to us here today or the testimony that Tim Colley gave yesterday to our state colleagues or to what you all say in public. And I don't feel like anything that's happened since the initial blackout in the middle of July has given much confidence to the public or to elected officials. Uh, we, I feel like there is a lot of platitudes. I feel like there is a lot of technical uh, language that's used that the public doesn't easily understand, that doesn't translate, that they don't have expertise in. And today, we had, I had some basic questions, my colleagues are have plenty of questions that there weren't uh, answers to. So uh, you're making a lot of money, you're providing a dividend in return to your uh, shareholders. You continue to ask for rate increases year after year after year. And then things happen and you stand up and say, we're still very great. We're wonderful. We're doing all this good stuff. There seems to be a total mismatch, I think, potentially in the perception you have of yourself and the perception that the public has of you. And uh, I think it's important for any agency, any entity, any organization to have a candid, introspective assessment of themselves. And there has not really been a much level of contrition, I think. I feel like there are throwaway lines that I, that I read uh, in testimony that I heard today that I saw from Mr. Colley in the aftermath. If I were you, I would be saying, I am so effing sorry for what happened. I am so, this is embarrassing. I am, this is terrible. We know that there are people in nursing homes and on ventilators and people that don't have air conditioning and businesses that are losing money. And we are sorry. I don't hear that. There's not that enthusiasm or that exuberance or that passion in what's been said. Tim Colley should be here today. I don't know why he's not here. He went yesterday. He should come here. I'm very disappointed he's not here. But anyone who's a public representative should be saying that. The governor is outraged and saying what has he said about Con Ed, that you don't have a right to your license to operate in the state. You're hearing elected officials and the public over and over again talk about what happened. You had hundreds of people stuck in elevators across the city. Thousands of businesses affected. Tens of millions of dollars lost. And I don't hear that level of apology from Con Ed from the day it happened until today or yesterday with Tim Colley. I don't know who does your PR. I don't know who does your communications. I don't know who details what you should say publicly or in testimony. But you need someone new to advise you on how to communicate with the public because it is inadequate and laughable at this point. You should be saying, damn, we are sorry. We screwed up. We're going to be transparent about it. We're going to be, uh, say this in a way that the public understands. I don't hear that. It's like all this technical gobbledygook of what most people in the public don't understand. So there are going to be plenty more questions today, but I'll tell you that as elected officials have to communicate with our constituents, that hear from our constituents every single day, they're pissed. They're unhappy, not just with what happened on the days the blackout happened, but they're unhappy with your communication since then and with how you communicate with them via the press and publicly. That is another big aspect of this, and it's one that I think they should seek to change as quickly as possible. Just one, um, we have, I think there's one outstanding, if I calculate, there's one outstanding question, which was when was the, uh, relay inspected uh, in the west side, and so I think Steve has an answer on that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, relays are inspected every five years. I mentioned that it was installed in 2008. These systems that misoperated, well, three of them, uh, were inspected 2014, 15, and 16. So just as a piece of information. So it had been a while. 
on cycle. Inspect it on cycle. Yeah, but it's still been a while. Every five Might years. Might be on cycle, but it's still been a while. Every five years. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, uh, for your intensive questioning. Uh, I think we got all through a lot of uh, the important questions that need to be asked, but I'm going to drill uh, a little deeper. Um, can you explain specifically to the public on why you are seeking a rate increase of 8.6 percent from consumers? And what type of analysis is involved in that calculation? Uh, that's across, again, that, that rate increase is, uh, we're looking for a three-year, that's a three-year rate increase we're, we're looking for. And we work with the Public Service Commission um, and stakeholders when we present that plan. And essentially, it's, it's our analysis of what we need to invest to assure reliable uh, a service to customers, also incorporating needed expansion, load relief, and also to bring uh, new customers online. The city is growing. You see uh, cranes up all over the city in Brooklyn and Manhattan, uh, still vibrant growth in the city. So and we need to continue to invest. A again, this isn't m money we, we, uh, we, we, we're asking for to put in our pockets. We're, we're, we're asking to invest it in the system in, uh, to secure reliability and, and needed growth. At the end of the three years, how much do you expect to generate in revenue because of these increases? We have a fixed rate of return that is negotiated in each rate case. Um, it's, it tip I can't speak about the rate case right now because it's in pro process, but typically that floats around 9%. It's now, out of, out of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, out of the $1.378 billion in profits that Con Ed made last year, the $9.5 million that goes to the CEO every single year and the $84.6 million that went into dividends, how much of that is going to be reinvested back into Con Edison's uh, upgrades and management? So we spend, uh, our net income is about a billion and a half, uh, and our capital program is about a billion and a half, so they're not necessarily, it's not the same dollars, um, but it's essentially equivalent to our, our net profit, the amount of money we are putting back into the system. Okay. Do you, would, you, would you say that it's fair to, to uh, say that uh, consumers should, should be a little sour about the fact that their rate increases are going up while so much money is being invested in shareholders, a CEO, and overall profits? So it's just really important that, th that these, the, the, the first premise is that you have to invest in a system, and it's an expensive system to invest in, given the the, 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 urban, the density of the urban fabric that we're operating in. So whoever is, whoever is running that has to invest in the system, and they have to raise capital in the capital markets. And the way we raise capital in the capital markets is through debt um, at around 4%, uh, and shareholders who are willing to invest their, mostly the retirement funds, into um, a stable, dividend-paying stock. That's sort of the, the basic idea, is that you have people who want stable dividend-paying stocks who are looking for current income. They invest in th infrastructure companies, and Con Edison has proven to be a good investment for that population. Given everything that we have to accomplish together in terms of our, our clean energy future, the, the amount of investment we're putting into the system um, is going to have to increase as we think about how to meet people's demand. And so um, that's essentially how we attract capital is the, are those dividends. So what that's how the city, that's how this, the city itself is relying on us attracting um, those shareholders and, and to access in the debt markets to, to pay for the infrastructure. What, what guarantee do you provide New Yorkers that your customers that the, the increase is going to go into upgrading your failing infrastructure? The, the, so I just, well, I just want to make, just take quick exception to the idea that it's failing infrastructure because I think the statistics show that it's, it's not failing. We have had outages and those are regrettable, but I just, I just have to just, I, I can't let that, that's, it's not about a failing infrastructure story. Uh, having said that, we negotiate these rate cases with the Public Service Commission. We're heavily regulated. Um, we propose what we want to invest in. They actually propose separately what they think we should invest in, and we come to a settlement. Um, often, so we are highly regulated on that. So they are helping us running, our, in, in many ways, also running our system in terms of the capital that we're investing in. But we also report back to them about what we're spending. We're, there's constant check-ins and accountability for how is that money getting spent. Uh, is it getting spent in the right way? If we're overspending, there were, we're subject to revenue ad re adjustments. So th every step along the way, we are heavily regulated by the PSC in terms of 
what we're spending and how we're spending it. And so that, that's the level, that's, that is the, the basic purpose of the PSC is to provide that accountability. Yeah, in, in your testimony, I heard, uh, we, we heard a lot about testing and maintenance. What, what is Con Ed is doing to upgrade their systems to take us to the next, to the future? Talk about renewables. With regard to renewables? And renewables, so, your systems, so, so, so two we things. Can uh, make uh, sure that it's not ailing in the future. So, so uh, we're, we're very familiar with renewables. In fact, our, our, our corporation is the uh, second largest solar developer uh, in the United States. Uh, with regard to wel welcoming and incorporating renewables onto our system, um, we've got an underground system that now we, we've got an ability to uh, lock in, so to speak, our network protectors so we can accept uh, solar power into our network grid um, more easily than we've been able to in the past. And a lot of utilities, uh, those utilities that have underground facilities have, have struggled bringing um, bringing solar power onto non-radial systems. We, we have very open access uh, for renewables. Uh, we welcome them. I, if you look at the regulatory um, uh, direction in the last 30 years that we've been under, it, it's really been an effort to kind of reduce uh, Con Edison from a, a vertically integrated utility where you had all of the customer operations, the sale of electricity, the production of electricity, and the transport, to reduce it um, really to what would be considered the natural monopoly, which is any enterprise that uh, uh, two people competing can't possibly do as efficiently as, as one person, right? And that paradigm for that would be a water service, right? You can't have two water pipes in a street and it's, it's more efficient than having one. Uh, so we've taken the generation assets and they've gone off to a, 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 a free market, so to speak, and, uh, and certainly on gas and electric, you can purchase gas and electric from uh, whoever, whoever you'd like. We really are uh, just a transport system for electric and gas. That's our main business. And uh, we, we, we're open to renewables. We're working with Any, them. I guess, I just, uh, I'll, I'll take a note, just uh, add, add to this question. I'll turn it over to Steve. So um, on our website, there's a, uh, we just released a report in January of uh, all the 20-year, the essentially, capital plan that's essentially focused on, and a big part of it is focused on getting ready for uh, renewable future, and so things like grid modernization, we're going to spend uh, you know four to five billion dollars there, and that's es essentially in, in the past the grid, uh, you get the the electrons from Indian Point or some points west, and they come to your house um, when you turn on the, the light switch. Um, that's all changing, and the idea is that we need a two-way grid so that if you have solar on your roof and I'm your neighbor, uh, I might be able to. The grid has to find a way to get the electrons that are coming from your roof to my house, that kind of thing. So that's grid modernization, um, ele electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We have a, a program with the city. Uh, we think there's gonna be you know, uh, wide scale adoption of electric vehicles pretty soon, and, but we don't have the infrastructure. So it's a bit of a chicken or the egg. So we've decided that it's the chicken and we're doing the infrastructure uh, and the cars will follow. Um, also looking at ways to um, make the system more self-healing so that you don't necessarily have widespread outages. This is something that's more effective on the overhead system um, that Dave and his team have spent a lot of time um, where they have overhead systems thinking about how to make the system more self-healing so that uh, when there's a tree fall, during weather events when a tree falls or a mylar balloon or a squirrel, that you don't necessarily lose 1,000 people, you may only lose 500 because the system can automatically adjust. Um, we're looking at, uh, programs around cable and manhole monitoring. So you have remote systems in manholes that can detect when there are heat issues or there's something going on in a manhole that you wouldn't necessarily know in, in, until it explodes. Um, so this is giving us early warning on issues that are happening in manholes. So these are all, and I could go on and on and on. There's a, re, a very detailed yeah, report so on the website. Ba about back, this. back to your to your customers that were affected by the power outages. Sure. Uh, you know, Con Ed often talks about the amount of customers that were affected, but we we know that there are many instances you have buildings uh, that can be counted as one customer with multi units. Do so we have an exact number of how many New Yorkers are actually affected because of these in, power outages? So I believe in the in the in the uh, outages in Southeast Brooklyn. The, uh, the customer count was 33,000. The impacted um, population was, I believe, 89,000. 89,000? 89,000. The customers that, um, that were not interrupted in the Flatbush networks, were, were, which essentially were, uh, we prevented from going out of power with the preemptive interruption, uh, approaches um, over 300,000. 
Now, b because of these outages, as mentioned earlier, there, we had a lot of consumers that lost, uh, you know, experienced a loss of goods. Um, you mentioned there was a rebate refund program. How many of the 89,000 in Brooklyn so, or, or across the city? So, well, have, so far have we've received so far. so far we've received about almost 3,600 um, claims, and we've already got a thousand checks out. 3,600 claims. 3,600 claims, and we've already thousand. gotten more than a thousand checks out. It, does there need to be more outreach on on? Uh, it's on it's on our website. Um, we'll, we'll if you want to get it out through com community boards or through your offices, we'd be glad to give you that information. How much Absolutely. have you paid out in in, um, in exact I do dollars? have that m in my notes. I think it's a, it's above a quarter of a million dollars already. A quarter of a million out. dollars. Right. But I, I I really have to go through all the notes to get the exact number. Yeah. You know, just looking at the Brooklyn numbers, having eighty nine thousand customers, only at, only thirty six hundred people have applied. I think there must be some sort of communication issue uh, with your cons with your with your customers. Well, I, I wouldn't know that everyone suffered that loss because remember the the customers went out of lights at at seven thirty two p.m. and by midnight we had um, we had about fifty five percent of those customers back in service, right? So that was n not not everyone was for out for for past twelve hours, and w and we're not that strict about the twelve hours with claims. We we don't uh, have such a strict line. People should send in our claims if they had a loss, if they believe they they lost food and they had to throw stuff out. They should. They should uh, get a claim and submit it. Got it. Well, so, so um, something unrelated to this, but related when it comes to public utilities, is we know National Grid is holding a lot of our small businesses and and uh, New Yorkers uh, hostage uh, because they want to have the Williams pipeline um, uh, uh, be be approved. Uh, is that kind of isn't doing anything to help these consumers that are that are facing uh, these problems? Yes, uh, we think there's a, a we, we, looking at the numbers. We think there's about 2,600 uh, customers right now that uh, m might possibly be seeking uh, an electric solution. About half of those will be in our service territory. Um, and, and as I said before, we're a summer peaking utility, so we think you know these folks. This would be a winter demand, so we think there's there's adequate capacity in the short term. Uh, in one of my prior assignments. I worked in the Energy Services Department. That's the department that project manages customers onto our system who are looking for a new or additional service in electric and gas. And um, so those folks could, uh, could apply with us. We'll, we'll work with them on getting the electric they need. But we think in the short term, there's definitely uh, sufficient capacity. And, and as larger uh, numbers come forward, we certainly can uh, have the wherewithal and the access, the capital, and the expertise to build what's needed. It's what is Con Edison's official position on the pipeline? So the pipeline is not our project. Um, we are not an investor in the project. We are not a financial beneficiary to the project in any way. Um, but the New York City gas system op also operates as one organism, essentially. So we um, essentially most of the gas comes in from the west, and it's transferred through the city through Con Edison piping and delivered to National Grid uh, territory. Um, the way it essentially works is there's all private companies uh, con that, that own the gas pipes coming into the system, coming into New York City. Each company buys a certain amount of capacity on that pipe, and so we are essentially buying a certain amount of capacity, National Grid is buying capacity on the pipe, and we're sharing that infrastructure. Um, to the extent that um, National Grid is not able to meet its demand and buys more capacity on the pipes that we're currently sharing, it does impact us. And so the letter that we sent in the past couple of months saying was just indicating that we are not immune to whatever happens to the outcome of the Nessie pipeline in terms of Con Edison and its ability to meet gas demand in the city. Um, as you know, we have a, a moratorium on new connections in, in Westchester. Um, but having said that, our, our, our official position is that it's Overall, having that pipeline is beneficial to the gas ecosystem in New York City in terms of avoiding uh, moratoriums, um, but it's not necessarily our project, and we can't weigh on the merits of the environmentals. Well, th I think we all I, th I think we all can agree in this room that climate change is real, correct? And we have to start moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, and I think that Con Edison, as, as an electric provider, uh, has an important role in playing and making and helping make that switch. Is there any internal conversations of how we move away from 
fractured gas and start looking at renewable energy, electric, and a role Con Edison can play uh, to help advocate for that? Sure. So we, uh, there's a number of things going on. Um, I think the biggest is that we have, um, we feel like we have a big role to play. We are the number two solar producer uh, in North America, um, but because of certain rules, we're not able to provide those renewable electrons uh, those in uh, New York State. Um, so we've been advocating for, uh, and we, we also believe that, going back to the question you asked earlier about raising money, one of the, our biggest advantages is that we can, we can raise relatively inexpensive capital to fund infrastructure in the city. And we also believe we should be able to, to extend that inex ability to raise inexpensive capital on building renewable assets around New York State and getting those renewable electrons into New York City. We're currently not able to do that. So uh, I would say utility-owned generation is one big piece, thinking about how to make the grid more available for uh, distributed generation and renewable generation is two. Um, thinking about the, moving away from fossil fuels, um, we do believe that there is a, a role, um, and this is sort of one of the fundamental debates among people, it, it, we're not saying we, we don't believe in climate change, but we also believe that gas has a role in the transition and that you can't necessarily just shut off um, the gas system because people at the end of the day want to be able to heat their homes uh, and cook. And sometimes in some places the alternatives are not necessarily available. Having said that, we think there's a role for natural gas and that um, we've got to really sit down and think about how the transition is going to work. So you're, you're, you're the largest producer of solar, uh, but you mentioned that you can't sell it in New York State. What, what are the obstacles you're facing? So, it, so, so what, I'm, what I mean by that is, so right now, if we wanted to go build a 1,000 megawatt solar farm in um, somewhere not in, not in New York City, we would not be able to do that. Um, because the, uh, when um, deregulation happened in the 90s, the basic idea is they split out power generation from power distribution. And so a solar farm is considered, or a wind farm is considered generation. Um, so we are not able to own generation anymore because, we, because of deregulation in the 90s. And that is, it's not necessarily a legislative issue. I mean, in terms of a law prohibiting it, it's a, um, a conversation we have with the PSC on whether or not we should be able, can, be, can own those assets. Right. Uh, one example uh, of those assets we, we'd really like to, to bring online would be community solar. Right. Uh, we have certain facilities with large roof areas. We think we could fund the development of a community solar project where individual consumers who ordinarily wouldn't have access to, to solar power could subscribe and be a portion, a part owner in that. And we could certainly uh, fund that development through our regulated company. Beyond that, we also have an affiliate, an unregulated affiliate with our transmission company, which is now working with uh, uh, other utilities in uh, developing transmission assets that one day will support uh, the government's initiatives for offshore uh, wind projects and the, and the like to bring, bring other renewables onto the system. All right, thank you. I'm gonna pass the mic to uh, one of the other chairs. Thank you, Chair Espinal. Um, so we, the speaker talked a little bit about the climate change vulnerability study that's supposed to be completed and still hasn't. Um, what dollars have you set aside to implement those recommendations when they do come out? As of yet, we haven't really been informed by them. And, and the timeline that study looks at is, I believe, all the way out to 2080. And there'll be a, a lot to think about when that comes out. Again, in the short term, how uh, long do you plan on taking to think? I mean, uh, you've taken five years to get us a well, study. These are, How these much are, more are we going to waste? Th these are really going to be multi-year plans. Um, it's, it's really something that has to be looked at. I think in the short term, I think we'll evaluate the, uh, the global warming issue. Should we index that, uh, that temperature variable, that design criteria from 86 to 87, and the impacts that might have on our, on our capital plan? Uh, and again, as I said before, other important stakeholders uh, w w might consider increased investment in energy efficiency as, as the better short-term plan uh, for those marginal dollars. All right. I mean, so it's, we have already know, I mean, I can kind of give you a, a sneak preview, right? It's, it's every year it's gotten hotter, right? In human history, we're going year after year in this decade, it's getting hotter every year. Um, what are we doing to sort of accommodate that? Because along with the heat, we're also getting 
more precipitation, right. which means more rain. So before the study even comes out, we know sort of how the book's going to end. So Right? We, we, I can kind of skip to the end of the book. Like I can tell you, that, you know, it's, it's going to continuously get worse. It's going to continue to be hotter. It's continue to be more wet. What are we doing to make sure that we're upgrading the system in a way that meets what the IPCC talks about, that the, you know, you know, we sort of know the different climate models that are out there. What are we doing to sort of meet those models? Right. So, so as I said before, we're going to do a sensitivity analysis and take a look at what that... And how long will that take? What that... I, I would say we could have that done within a year, get, get an idea of what that impact would look like. And we Why don't get is that to make, not happening we don't get now? To make, sir, let me just finish. We don't, we don't get to make uh, changes in our design criteria on our own. It's, it speaks to the level of investment we're allowed to make. We have to make that in company with our regulator. It's a, it's a significant decision. And I, I, I don't think it, 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 there's a specific, there's a specific answer to your to your question, which, which Dave is giving you. And there's a broader answer, was that the transition is, and we've spoken about this before. We're not necessarily. I mean, you can sit around and wait for a study to tell you how to design your system, and that's what Dave is talking about in terms of. How you know what does the system and yes the the end, end result is likely that it's it's going to be hotter and we need to have more systems in place but there's so many other things that are happening inside of Con Edison in the public that are not waiting for any study to be done to get us ready for this transition and the best one I can think of is our investment in smart meters this is the backbone of our clean energy future where um, this is going to give us granular data in terms of how people are using. Um, their energy, where they're using their energy. It's going to allow, get, be the, um, the, the backbone of us being able to use more dynamic energy pricing plans to get people to use less energy or to have more, uh, more choices uh, and more control over how they're using their energy. So uh, I, I wouldn't want it to be put out there that we're waiting for this study so that we can do everything. There's so many things that are happening that I could go through, but I don't want to take all your time that I appreciate mean that. that that the the transition is well underway inside of Con Edison. A specific example um, Kyle's talking about would be time of use rates, right, where we can take that peak demand and uh, through pricing signals uh, get the behavior of consumers to change where they can they can charge vehicles, specifically set timers to charge vehicles at night, do laundry at night, things of that nature, and we can do that with smart meters. Smart meters will also give us much more granular information about load growth, which will influence our, our plans for... I, I hear a lot about smart meters. What I, what I don't understand is that there was kind of projected, um, you know, previous to this heat wave that, you know, the sort of, the, the sort of max was about 13,300 megawatts, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And that this, this particular heat wave came in around 12,000 and some change. So we weren't at that projection, correct? Correct. correct. And yet we experienced significant outages and challenges to the system. Right. So, so, so I don't know how a smart meter, you, you, you're giving me a lot of this about the smart meters, how, does, how would that sort of, we have a problem here, right? We, we right. didn't hit where we thought we were going to hit because of the demand, because of the heat, and we still saw massive outages and challenges to the system, people being sort of blacked out. What are we doing as it gets hotter and demand is going to conceivably possibly go up. What are we going to do to sort of solve this problem? What's what's the answer to the riddle here? So just that, yeah, Steve, that's what I'm not getting so what, uh, from you. I want a lot of you know sort of talk about the smart meters. So the link is that between smart meters and and, and preparation, and I'll let I know Steve wanted to say something. Is um, so for example in in different parts of the neighborhood, if we have if um, in the future, rather than shutting down a network, you may be able to pick individual. Um, or sets of meters necessarily. You don't necessarily have to shut down a specific part of the network. You can find load relief in shutting down specific parts um, and, and or bring them up specifically. So that's, at the end of the day, one of the issues that we're gonna have to deal with as a city in terms of, there's one piece which is grid investment and everything we've talked about and putting more feeders down and putting more assets into the ground, more transformers, more substations. But the other idea is that people at the end of the day need to just be able to have the tools to use energy s more smartly. And, and so, and that's going to be a big part of the solution in, in those hottest days is that people have the ability to control. Right now, in your home, you're either, either your air conditioner is on or off. Um, and it's, and you can move the temperature, but you have all these other appliances that are, that are drawing electricity. 
and having a smart meter is going to give you the ability to have make smarter choices about what's going on, and that's just a that's just the link to the equation. Yeah, okay, just, so let me just talk on the on the twelve thousand megawatt part. Just mm -hmm. what that you have to keep in mind on a Sunday, uh, you know, you don't have the load in Manhattan. That's it. That twelve thousand megawatts is the whole system. So you're going to see a somewhat lower number discount on a Sunday when Manhattan's businesses are not, uh, you know, the city isn't filled with businesses that are up and running. So that's a larger number on a Monday through Friday basis. So, And this we'll network has actually seen higher demand on a summer day, So, um, go, which goes to a question, uh, goes to the point that it's, it's not necessarily the network or issues in the network, it's just there was, there's, there was a cascade of failures that happened, and that's something that's right. inherent to having a network system. Right. But is, at the end of the day, though, there was failure. Yes. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I, I think you keep Agreed. defending the fact that there, this wasn't a system failure. There was a significant failure here, right? I mean, yes, the speaker absolutely. talked about that. Absolutely. And you keep trying to defend this as if somehow the infrastructure is keeping up, but it's not. Because obviously, if it was, we wouldn't have seen the outages. You're not here today to celebrate a great job in July. This is not the topic. No. That's the name, not the name of the hearing. We never are. The hearing <laughs> is like sort of talking about the outages, right? So we're talking about failure. So I agree with the speaker when like acknowledging that there is a problem here and it needs to be fixed in a sort of more transparent way instead of trying to, I mean, I'm an attorney as well, but trying to hide behind sort of the legalese here is not what we need to be doing. We need to be much more sort of addressing that there, were, there are system failures, there are problems that are going on and how do we fix them, right? Absolutely, and, and as the Vice President of Brooklyn, Queens, I have bottom line responsibility for serving customers in that region. And we, we disappointing results, absolutely, this summer. We work hard to prevent that. What we really want to make the point of is we do not have a failing infrastructure, uh, and this was really a unique set of circumstances. That but they're not unique. Well, I that's, mean, the, I'm, that's the, the, the entire line of my questioning. I think they're not unique, right? It's going to continue to get hotter. Right? It's going to continue to get more wet. It's not my climate models. This is not the, the Costa Constantinidis book on environmental science. Right? These are like scientific professionals who continue to lay out that it's going to continue to get hotter every year and wetter every year. So this is not a unique set of circumstances. It's in full out of the sky. This is like the new normal. Right? So how do we sort of deal with that new normal? I think the unique set of circumstances is referring to the unique set of equipment circumstances, not necessarily the unique set of weather circumstances. Um, so we're not denying that it's getting hotter or anything like that. It's just I just want to clarify that it's not about a unique. We're not seeing that as a, uh, a hot day as being unique. Okay. So let, let's talk a little bit about sort of some of the issues that are around Con Edison at the moment. I sort of brought up in my opening uh, statement around sort of your charging the ratepayers for trade associations, and that many of these trade associations have uh, sort of connections to anti-climate science and sort of a championing of natural gas and fossil fuels. So how do we reconcile charging the ratepayers for those particular memberships? So I think the memberships you're talking about are Edison Electric Institute uh, and the American Gas Association? Correct. So uh, Edison Electric Institute, um, you know, there is, uh, we think the ratepayers, at the end of the day, um, benefit a lot from being part of the uh, national conversation. Uh, Con Edison is seen within those groups as a leader um, uh, on issues of reliability, on issues of cybersecurity, uh, on the network system. Uh, it it's, uh, keeps us very close to the industry. Um, there's a lot going on inside EEI with respect to renewable energy uh, and, and those conversations. Um, so These are the same trade associations that give money to ALEC. Right? So, I mean, if you're seen as a leader, you hold yourself out as like the second largest solar producer in the country. You, you, you're, you're sort of portraying yourself to be a champion of renewable energy, but at the same time, you're giving money to folks who are sort of saying that because it, we had a cold day, climate science doesn't exist, right? So, how do you reconcile that? So, we're not giving money, just to be clear, <laughs> we're not giving money, to, but I understand through the transitive property, UCS is giving money to ALEC. I think the idea there is that there's a lot that, that on balance, the cust our customers gain from being part of these trade associations and the company being a part of these national conversations. And it's also our, frankly, uh, we have a lot of influence inside those organizations and 
are able to shape policies that are, at the end of the day, to the benefit of Con Edison I, I could go all day just on this particular topic, but I won't because I want to make sure we, we stay on, on time. Um, let's talk a little bit about methane leaks. I know we sort of had some testimony around bills. You know, the, methane's 86 times more potent, uh, and yet um, you, know, you consistently downpay that sort of leakage rate. Um, and sort of fixing the system. You talk about the system not being failing, and yet we sort of have issues of methane leaks, um, which is one of the highest in the country. How do you reconcile your statements on methane and, and not being um, a sort of a system that is in sort of having leaks and having challenges? We have a we have a robust main replacement program. It's um, it approaches 100 miles uh, a year. Um, and that's, that's up considerably in the last five years, and we think that's the best way of, of replacing leak-prone pipe. Uh, so we have an aggressive strategy for replacing that pipe um, and, and really have brought a lot of resources to that, to that issue. But it's still happening, right? We're still having yes. issues of leakages. It's a big, it's a big We're system. still having challenges in the system. It's a very big system. You tell me today that we have a system that's in good repair. It's a very big system. 100 miles a year is really an aggressive strategy. All right. Um, other questions I do have, uh, you know, 36% of payday loans are taken out to cover utility bills. Uh, you know, why should New Yorkers continue to take out high interest loans just to pay their gas and electric? I mean, it's one of the highest in the country, right? So like, why, why, are, why should families have to take out payday loans to pay or their utility bills? I mean, that, the that's- pri The price of electricity, if you look, if you break down the bill, uh, for electricity, it's basically, if you break it down, it falls into thirds. About a third of the, the Con Edison bill is taxes and fees that we pay. About a third is for supply for those customers who don't want to buy gas or electric from a third party. And about a third is for our tran transmission and distribution assets for, for capital expansion, uh, replacement, and uh, maintenance. The other thing I would say yeah, is that, you know, the. Uh, each year, we collect about a billion and a half of taxes uh, and remit those. I think it's actually a billion seven, um, and remit those directly to the city. Um, so there, a big component of the bill is property taxes that are paid on the asset. So what's end up happening actually is as we invest in the system, we are assessed a new property tax rate on those investments, and that goes. Um, directly to the city. So uh, a, a, there's a third of it is just the cost of energy, a third of it is what the cost is to get this energy to you, and a third of it is the cost to um, pay taxes uh, on the system. One thing we do do for, uh, there, there, there's a lot of resources available um, to for customers who are not able to afford their bills who might be on public assistance, and we can get information to all of you, uh, but there's uh, we work closely with HRNA to, to uh, help uh, offset some costs or for those who are struggling to pay their bills. Uh, so my last questions are, you know, we had a really hard time. I mean, and I didn't, my community did not have the same level of challenges during the blackouts as South Brooklyn or, or the west side of Manhattan. But we had a real challenge getting people on the phone and getting hard answers. Um, I had constituents calling me that they were out of service. I wasn't getting updates in real time. I was getting lots of press releases from Con Edison. Um, I kept them all on my phone. I got lots and lots of press releases talking about how you were on the job. Um, but I wasn't getting a level of reach out, a level of here's what's happening in your community. Uh, what do you say to, you talk about communication and, and how it needs to be better. What are your plans to actually make it better in the future that we are having real-time discussions about how constituents can get their power back rather than getting consistent sort of celebratory emails from Con Edison and on press releases. There's a disconnect there that concerns me very much. So this is something, so we've had about a dozen um, or so meetings with elected officials um, since the outages. And I think this has been a consistent feedback um, is that um, they weren't, uh, they're concerned about their level, and this is something we also learned in Riley and Quinn, that people at certain times really want direct information. Um, this is a development point for us. I think we're, we're gonna take this back, that it's my responsibility. Um, we do our best to communicate with elected officials. Um, sometimes people, different elected officials want different levels of information. Um, 
and we just have to figure out that algorithm. I know in your case, I'm, it's regrettable that you were not getting directly contacted in real time, and I, I apologize for that. I think there's a development point for us is not necessarily just to take this back and say, we'll fix it. It's, I've been thinking a lot about in those meetings what we can actually tangibly do. And I think first is I want to invest in uh, systems that make it more proactive and automatic at different thresholds uh, of outages. And that's something that, that these are things that are squarely in my control, which is why I can sort of commit to them today. Um, I think also what I've learned in, in, this, in these conversations over the last month or so is that, and a lot of this has come up in, in our conversation today, is at the end of the day, people don't necessarily understand what we're doing with our capital that we're raising um, through the bills. And so that delivery charge that you pay on your bill, that's essentially going to fund the system. You know, you have the energy cost, then that's just the cost. It costs the electrons and the gas. The, uh, and the, there's delivery se section and there's taxes. On that delivery section, we need to do a better job communicating with our communities about what we're actually spending capital on. Because at the end of the day, they really, people don't necessarily under understand we're spending capital on. They just see the street is dug up or they, are, or they um, uh, rarely but occasionally experience uh, an outage. And so I think we need to work better on, on that interaction with customers and our electeds and happy to come to the council and brief more proactively on things like the rate case settlement. Uh, we can, we'll certainly brief you on the climate change vulnerability study when it comes out at the end of the year. We will have it, the city. Will it, will it definitely come out? Are, are you that's, committing that's, today that, that it'll be at the end of the year? To the best of my knowledge, had that's... had back a couple of times already. That, are you committing here on the stand today that it'll be by December 31st when the ball drops to bring in 2020, that study will finally be in, in the hands of the people this evening? To the best of my knowledge today, that's, that's the date. It is not necessarily something I can control or commit to, so I wouldn't want to do that. Um, it's also not something I'm in, intimately involved with, but um, that is my best knowledge here to you, before you today. That is the date. Um, I think the last thing is, um, you know, briefing on the rate case settlement, briefing on the vulnerability study, um, briefing the council on, this, on the um, study we're doing with the city on investments that are going to be needed at the grid to meet electrification needs. Uh, there's an EPRI study that I mentioned on technologies that are needed. That's going to be a fascinating study that we have, we are planning to brief the council on as well. So uh, I think in addition to having better systems on proactive out, um, outreach with respect to outages. Um, I think there are certain things we can do to be more transparent and proactive on our, our capital. And the last thing I'll ask, and, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Chair Brannon. Um, I think the speaker may have covered this as well. The sort of nationally recognized rule for food safety is that for, for dairy, you know, this is the FDA. This isn't, again, the city of New York. This is the FDA that you know, dairy, meats, eggs, they have to be kept if they lose power more than four hours, they're not kept in a safe temperature for more than four hours, they have to be discarded, right? And then, but your reimbursement policy for food spoilage requires a blackout at least 12 hours. So we have supermarkets in my district that threw out a trailer full of goods. Mm -hmm. I have a bakery that had to throw out, you know, almost their entire inventory, but yet they're not eligible for reimbursement based on your food based on your food spoilage blackout rules. So how do we sort of recognize you know, sort of reconcile the FDA ruling that says more than four hours got to go with 12 hours on your end for reimbursement? We'll certainly consider those claims. We would encourage those folks to submit claims and, and detail the impacts they had um, and, and we'll certainly consider them. To be considered. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't think the 12 hours we, we, we hold is a very, very uh, firm exact It's not a line. firm rule. And it's, just, it's also just not in our interest to, to be petty about it. So right. I don't think we are going to be. So I will make sure that I am speaking, if they suffer, to, the, I'm if they speaking to those business owners today and making sure that they are filing claims with you um, with a, a letter from my office sort of detailing this conversation on the stand. Please do so. Great. Thank you very much. With that, I'll, I'll hand it back to, to uh, Chair Espinal or Chair Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think I, mean, I think kind of what my colleagues and I are looking for is, at the very least, we wish that Con Ed would share our urgency um, a little bit more. Um, the vibe that we get is, you know, 
these aren't the droids you're looking for. There's nothing to see here. Everything is great. Um, and I don't know that, 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 that there's anyone who agrees with that. Um, I think sharing our urgency would certainly go a long way. Um, you know, when the CEO of Con Ed makes about 150 times what the average New Yorker makes, um, sharing our urgency is the least that I think Con Ed could do. Um, you know, for my district, um, Kyle, I mean, your team has been great. I mean, they're very responsive and they answer me when things go wrong, but we're so relieved when the lights finally go back on that we forget to talk about how to prevent this from happening next time. Um, and so much of our job as, as elected officials in the city is being reactive. Um, and there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of proactiveness happening um, when these things happen. And, and in my district, I still have a lot of overhead power lines. Um, and we've talked a lot about trying to bury these power lines. We're, we're told the cost is prohibitive. It's actually easier to fix the overhead power lines when they fail. But what happened over the summer in Manhattan happens in my district reliably every summer and every winter. You can set your watch the power will go out at least once a summer and at least once a winter. Without fail, I think for the past decade that I've been involved in service in this area. And again, we're always so thankful that the lights go back on and the air conditioner's back on and everything's back up and running that we just go, all right, we'll just, you know, we'll talk to you soon. And then it happens again and it happens again and it happens again and there's never any change, never. It's just, it's just, you know, we're responsive, we get the power back on, so we're good? Okay, we move on to the next crisis. Um, so I think sharing our urgency and, and understanding that this is just not acceptable. Um, and as it relates to the, the climate crisis that we're facing, um, and that we're going to have, by 2050, you're going to have almost 50 days a year that's going to be above 90 degrees, I, I just don't feel that, that we're being prepared. You guys seem way too calm. Um, for, for my blood pressure um, and for what I know, it, it, you know is coming down the pike here. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, there's one way to better understand and plan for extreme heat events, uh, which is by installing temperature and humidity sensors at substations. Um, does Conhead have any plans to install sensors like this at its substation sites? Not that I'm aware of, no. I, temperature and humidity sensors? Yes. Uh, no, not not. not but, do you, I mean, I, you're way more educated than I am. I, you know what they are. Yeah, mm -hmm. Right. I'm just, uh, why, why would it be specifically at the substation as opposed to what we currently have? Or do they, ha uh, do you have thermal sensors installed on cables or a plan to do that? To know when it's reaching the point that they're getting too hot? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought you were talking about just general ambient air temperature. Uh, so on our, on our substation equipment, yes, transformers, uh, you know, th things of that nature, yeah, we monitor the effect on our equipment very closely. In fact, we have a health index that goes along with all the major bulk power transformers in our area stations and our transmission stations. So that all goes into our maintenance program very close to watch, you know, what, what may approach higher temperatures that our equipment is designed for that, te that temperature. And I'm imagining like in the old movies where there's this room and you see these things beeping and you're looking at substation 25 and you see that it's starting to get hotter and hotter. Is that what's happening and you're monitoring this and saying, okay? Mm -hmm. including, including oil sampling, online oil monitoring that, that we get readings on every 15 minutes to watch uh, you know, temperature and condition of the oil as it, as it uh, occurs over time. So that, that's what helps us monitor the life of the transformers. On, and he's talking about the bulk power system. Out onto the distribution system, even our distribution transformers in the underground networks, the majority of them have pressure, temperature, and oil, oil uh, monitoring uh, on them. So we are watching what's, what's developing on the system. And any time that you want to come to Dave's office at 30 Flatbush and see the room with the lights beeping, as you said, you're welcome <laughs> to it. You're welcome so, to come. Yeah, and so again, I would say also is as you monitor transformers out in streets, transformers that supply people's, to people's homes, now you put that together with AMI metering and you start to really see what the drivers are, you know, what the load usage is, and where we have to target replacements to be done. 
So why are there areas in my district where we have, still have a lot of overhead power lines where we seem to be more vulnerable in the summer, in extreme temperatures, summer and winter, to outages? What's the, what's the difference? What's going on? So I would, I would tell you, we, overhead distribution is, is typically in, in areas uh, that, that are uh, predominantly uh, th three-story residential, uh, historically areas. Areas that have undergone uh, a growth cycle, we sometimes upgrade from 4 kV to 27. But wholesale undergrounding is, is something that's, that's rarely done. Typically, it's when an area undergo, undergoes uh, entire redevelopment uh, as, a, as a kind of a compound. We might make that conversion, particularly if they're very dense loads. Right, but uh, why, I'm, I know but why it's we, cost prohibitive, but why are, is it more vulnerable? It, it's more vulnerable because it's, it's uh, really uh, uh, more susceptible to uh, weather impacts, um, animal contacts, tree contacts, things okay. of that nature. It's out, it's out in the elements. The underground system um, it is more protected, but we, we also are exposed to, uh, you know, salt spread in the wintertime, which is... Uh, uh, well, that, so we get, the, we get the worst of both worlds because we're always told transformers blow up once a month in January and February because of the salt that gets underground. And we have overhead power lines. Yes, we do have issues in the underground in the winter, yes. But the cost to, to keep repairing this stuff is still cheaper than the cost of burying the power lines? So the, the cost of it, just in a per unit basis, if you compared overhead construction to underground construction, it would be about 10 to 1. Uh, traditional underground construction is about 10 times as expensive. It's very capital intensive. The after Sandy, we conducted an, an undergrounding uh, study uh, and, and, uh, with uh, stakeholders, and it's about $8 million per mile to go underground and $43 billion in total to underground the system. And that's only a component of the cost, right? Uh, we don't own the service uh, connection, the service panel into people's homes. That would have to be converted at their cost. And uh, for, for homes, it could be $2,500 to $5,000. For a commercial business, it could be up to $10,000. Uh, and all that is at customer cost. So it, a wholesale conversion is, is not something that's, that's uh, often contemplated. All right, I want to take a little voyage into the weeds here on, on what happened over the summer in, um, in southeast uh, Brooklyn. Um, so we had kind of knew that they'd be facing shortages due to the heat waves. Uh, projected that the peak demand for electricity would reach a little over 13,000 megawatts this summer. But peak demand was only around 12,000 megawatts when you cut power to Canarsie, Mill Basin and, and, and Flatlands. Um, the record is 13,322 megawatts, which occurred back in 2013, but it did not lead to blackouts like what we saw. Um, how did kind of determine that you should intentionally cut power without notice to these communities um, when it didn't seem like this was an unprecedented situation based on these numbers. So, so in my testimony, you know, you, you recall uh, we were facing a, a cascade, uh, and and the uh, the analysis uh, overwhelmingly indicated we were going to lose the entire network, uh, and we would have now had uh, 132,000 customers out of power, and rather than out of power for a number of hours, they could have been out of power for a number of days because of the extensive damage that occurs in a cascade and the amount of repairs that have to get made. Now, with regard to the peak, the disparity in the peaks, again, uh, this was a weekend um, peak, and it, during the weekends, we don't have the commercial loads on in, in areas predominantly like in Manhattan, but the residential loads are actually quite high. And if you look at the load curve for residential networks, which is a, a large uh, portion of, of, of Brooklyn and Queens, uh, residential peaks typically occur uh, around 7 p.m. when folks on a weekday, when folks go home uh, for dinner um, and go back to the domiciles. On the weekends, the peaks actually come in around 4 p.m. And, and stay there till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, so they are very heavily loaded. Before we were talking about the advantages of smart meters and the visibility that gives us, each of those smart meters is really a, a recording voltmeter, which, which basically can send data back. And we would get very granular data about the load uh, growth that's happening um, that's, so, so to speak, uncharted, like not, not really visible to us, the people who are out and, and, and buying additional air conditioners and, and TVs and things of that nature. 
Uh, the peak demand in this network was slightly above our prediction. Uh, part of that is related to that, to, to that the temperature was actually above design, and, and we think some of it is, is low growth that we hadn't seen. Smart meters will allow us to see that immediately at the end of each summer and plan for next summer. Okay. A couple but more again, I, I do want to make a point that there was, not, there was no lack of, uh, of supply. Uh, going into this, that network was, uh, there was no overloaded feeders in that network or in the Southeast Bronx network. It was, it was fine. It was really the coincident failure of these cables. Um, so Con Ed has procedures in place to reduce voltage by zero to five percent in most other parts of the city when the grid is stressed, but by eight percent in southern Brooklyn. Why is that? So, so at our, all of our regional substations, we can select either 5% or 8% voltage reduction. Uh, 5% um, is, and so the reason we do voltage reduction, so you have an understanding, is voltage reduction will, will cause a corresponding reduction in, uh, in load on the feeders. Uh, we get about f half of what the voltage reduction is. So for about a 5% voltage reduction, we'll see the current come down in the feeders about 2 2.5%. Linear loads like incandescent lightings will respond in, in that fashion, right? And um, so the, the load on feeders, the current on feeders, is directly related to the heating that occurs, right? Because all of our cables, all of our equipment is thermally rated, right? So there's a benefit there. In addition, the lower voltage, there's a lot of science in recent years that the lower voltage really reduces that stress on feeders and makes them more reliable. So um, this year, we, we exercised, I believe, um, voltage reduction at the 5% level uh, 11 times, and that progressed to 8% six times. When we go to 8%, um, it, there, is a, there is a greater likelihood that there will be impacts to certain customers in areas where we may have e defects out in the network that weren't identified, or customers who have, say, elevator equipment that is, uh, really has really very conservative pickup settings, they could be impacted. Um, when we select voltage reduction, um, we have a very robust uh, communication package related to that. Right, so how are people in those areas notified? So uh, when we select 8% uh, voltage reduction, our operators actually um, uh, select that. It commands the substation to, re to, to uh, uh, reduce voltage to 8%. And at the same time, a communication goes back out to uh, city agencies and we release a, um, a press release. Uh, we've, been, we've been in communication with, with stakeholders such as uh, the Office of Emergency Management. Um, they, they, they were talking about this outcome where we had a load shedding uh, event where we actually had to preemptively de-energize customers. We, we think we need to surround that event with better communication that, that uh, is, is really robust like we have around voltage reduction. So the, the decision uh, you know, this sort of disparity in, in the voltage reduction is based on, you're saying, the, the like borough populations? No. Uh, we, in this event, we went to 5% when we had two feeders out of service. Uh, and when we went to the, when the third feeder went out of service, now our network is beyond design, right? Uh, so everyone those, those feeders were out of service in that area in, in South Brooklyn? Yeah, those feeders, we had cable failures, right? Okay. So when it progressed to, so we design, so you understand, we design our system uh, in, in the city to withstand, um, at peak design, to withstand the loss of any two feeders in com any combination. Uh, when, we got, when we got to the second feeder out of service, we went to 5% voltage reduction. When we got to the third feeder outage, we went to 8% voltage reduction. And of course, that's when the public uh, appeals went out for consumers to see, to see if they could possibly limit uh, any non-essential load, as well as notifying the city and OEM that we were in a, uh, a, an 8% voltage reduction situation. So knowing that current climate projections are, are saying that by 2050, we're going to have 30 to 30 to 50 days that are going to be over 90 degrees. What are you guys preparing to do differently? So we're, we're, we're going to be informed by that study, which is really going to look at the impacts of electrification. And that's the one we don't. Well as, when yes. did we say we're getting that? Uh, that was the end of the year. Okay. Uh, and that'll look at um, the rather short-term impacts of, of that uh, heating and the long-term impacts of electrification. Uh, and then we've really got to work with our regulators and, and other stakeholders in, in deciding what are the elements of the plan to achieve that. And I think it's going to be a combination of infrastructure investment, 
uh, doing all we can to bring in additional renewables onto the system, as well as um, um, uh, avoiding demand, either with demand response or, which is uh, the best thing, is energy efficiency, right? That, that, hit, that energy efficiency strikes on all the important chords. It reduces carbon, it reduces our need to build infrastructure, and it reduces the build impact as a result of that infrastructure build. So, a simple question. If I'm living in one of these neighborhoods where you're going you're gonna to cut off my power, and my power, you know, my power is cut off. How am I getting this notification? So that's something. Again, we, we in speaking with it's OEM. And, minor, and, minor detail. No, oh, yeah, phones. No, phones would be the, would be the way to do that. Uh, but that that uh, was an issue that many stakeholders have have, uh, have raised with us. You mean and like home really phones? Got, and we've got a really. I've heard of them. No, we look at uh, texting, um, uh, banners on the. Um, on televisions. Uh, well, I can't I, turn my television no, on. I, I, I get that. I mean, we, okay. we've got to think that through. Um, but we essentially, we think mobile phones, most of those have, have a charge on them and can last for a while. Computers. Computers can't turn them on. Okay. I'm just saying, it's a, you know, you're about to turn off my power. My power is already turned off. There's no way for me to find out why it, why the hell it's off. And, and that's a question we're going we're gonna to work through. Um, we, we've really got to think it through. And much in the way we thought through voltage reduction. Um, this is unfortunately it's it's a circumstance that does not come up often, uh, and and I think we've got to spend some some time and attention in thinking through how we notify customers. There's not a great deal of time to let people know this is coming, and, uh, and we do everything we can to avoid it. It's the last option. Going back to the um, the um, the humidity uh, the thermal sensors. Do we have, does Con Ed have thermal sensors installed on cables? We have, um, what well we do, we are deploying out in our networks. We do have uh, remote devices that will tell us, uh, look into service boxes and give us uh, some information about uh, uh, water level, gases, uh, and, it, and have, give us some, some thermal information about what's going on in that, in that box. Uh, we can certainly model and predict what uh, temperatures are occurring on our cables uh, through through load devices and things of that nature. Yeah, I'd also say too, in, in uh, service boxes, manholes, we have been installing sensors that do infrared detection for us. So we're able to monitor that uh, and, and pick up failures before they occur. Uh, so we would be able to go out on those. We do that throughout the year, part of our maintenance program as well. Uh, you know, in the station, uh, really, when we say temperature monitor is important, looking at the, uh, the amps that are, a feeder is carrying is, is the most indicative thing. So when feeders are at their rating, uh, then we know if it's, if it's overloaded or underloaded, if it still has more capacity left in it. So that's, that's really where we target our, our replacement and maintenance activities at. Um, I want to I wanna end on um, a question about the FEMA uh, flood plan of your current design standards for key systems and equipment uh, for a flood event is the FEMA, the 2013 100 year flood plan plus three feet, is correct. that correct? Correct. Okay. Why do you think this standard is sufficiently protective and have you considered the FEMA plus five feet standard? And if not, why not? So when we went through our, our post-Sandy storm hardening, we worked with the collaborative and, and we went to the FEMA plus three, um, best information at the time, and that's what we did all of our storm hardening efforts around. Uh, there's East Coast resiliency right now is, uh, will be underway. Um, that is based around some of our facilities, obviously on the east side uh, around 14th Street. So we would be increasing some of our uh, storm hardening efforts there. We have to look at that, and, and I think certainly we'll see if the long-range projections even further than the FEMA plus three, then we have we have to consider incorporating that. And it's also in this study that we keep talking about. It's a big component of the study as to whether or not the standards change. You got to have a big party when the study comes out. Um, You're invited. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, last thing, uh, back to the, the the sensors on the cables. The cables that failed over the summer, did they have thermal sensors on them? Primary cables, no, we do not have uh, uh, thermal sensors on them. We None of them do? The primary distribution cables, no, we do not. Why not? 
uh, we're really not required uh, for us to be able to forecast what, what they're what, operating Wouldn't that at. have helped you? Not in this case, no. It, we, we can predict what those cables are running at. It's, it, it's really engineering. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, Chair Espino. I'd like to call on Councilmember Brad Lander from Brooklyn to ask a few questions. Uh, just let me give some clarity on where we are in the stack. Uh, we have uh, Councilman Brad Lander, Councilman Deutsch, Councilmember Debbie Rose, and Councilmember Traeger, who's also with us from Brooklyn. Uh, thank you very much to the chairs uh, for all these questions and, and really important ones. Um, and for the Star Wars reference, too, that was good. But, um, I, I want to continue, I guess, mostly along the line um, of Chair Constantinides, um, because it seems to me part of the challenge is we have a really big mismatch. Um, you know, we have a system that had critical failures this summer, subway, air conditioning, and, and the whole range of things that have been articulated, like critical failures. We've got the climate crisis challenges and the urgent need to transform the system to renewables, to reduce demand, to stop burning fossils. Um, and we have a, a big mismatch. It's just a super complex system with many actors, so no one is in neat control. You guys are in the hot seat today, and that is appropriate for this summer's crisis, but you don't have all the levers necessary to make to both address critical failures and drive massive transformation to prevent us from burning the planet up and get us to a place where the system is resilient for that future. Um, but I guess the question I want to ask you is like, how are we going to do that? Which is not how is Con Ed going to do it for us? Um, but we can't just you know, say, we'll get a study and we'll take another five years and you guys will tinker here and some other people will tinker there. You know, we passed our dirty buildings law, which I know has significant impact on the system, and, and Kyle spoke to the challenges that would be created if lots of people switch uh, to electric heat pumps and dramatically increase demand for electricity, which I think is what we need. It's just we also need to achieve renewable production, storage, and transmission that is consistent with that transformation. And maybe we'll have to live with some gas from here to there in transition, but that would be a lot more palatable if we knew how long that transition was and really had confidence that we were making it instead of just hoping that somehow all of this is going to fix itself. And it's impossible from listening this morning to have any confidence that we are on the path we need to be on. And today that's frustration at you guys, and so be it. But really what we need is frustration at the system that we are all a part of and a serious effort to bind ourselves to a path that will deliver. Um, and, and I, you know, you can't say today, like, here's the, here's the plan to get there, but you're a major actor in this system. And I guess I want to know, you know, if you communicated more like the speaker uh, at the end of his time, and, you know, you felt that real urgency for systemic transformation, and you wanted to say back to us, not just here's what Con Ed will do, but here is what we have to do together. What would, that, what would that look like? And what can we do to bind ourselves to that future better? Who else can we demand things of, as well as what we should be demanding of you to get on the right path forward? And, and I'll just leave it there. I mean, that's my question. I don't want to take more, more time. But I, that's what we have to use this hearing today to push you and us and every other actor in the system forward to do. Sure. I think it's an incredibly important question, and I think it's worthy of having, um, you know, a more extended conversation with the council around this. Because I think we we've danced around this at a lot of the different hearings. We've used um, some of the hearings, whether or not it's a story of Borealis or or the climate emergency, as as opportunities to try to get out some of these ideas. But I do think that what you're tapping into is that there is a very important need to have a big conversation with a lot of stakeholders about how we get there. And there's a lot of things that are happening inside of Con Edison, and, I, and I, I'm sorry that the, uh, the urgency that's, that, that seems to be lacking is not there, but I think it's also a building full of incredibly smart people who are very focused on maintaining reliability. 
um, of the system. And um, these larger policy questions about how we fundamentally transform our grid um, are not just questions that we can answer ourselves, you know, inside for Irving Place. I think the, the, the way that I think about it is there's the, one, the things that we can control are the, uh, the things that we're doing with the capital plan in terms of grid modernization that I already laid out. I don't necessarily need to talk through all that. Just in terms of getting the grid r fundamentally ready. Those are things we can control, um, getting it ready for two-way power flows and distributed generation and EVs, that kind of thing. So I won't go into that. I think the larger conversation is, separate apart from w getting the grid ready, it's this fundamental question of how are we going to produce all the renewable electrons? Where are they going to go? How are we going to get them to the city? Just really basic questions like that. Um, and the, the governor has you know, made significant goals for getting a lot of that to be offshore wind, uh, which is a, a laudable, and we're making tangible progress in moving those forward um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the finish line and getting the, the 9,000 megawatts starting with 800 uh, relatively soon. And we're very involved with that in terms of how to connect that to the grid. Um, so we've got to do a lot more of that, um, especially if we're going to become a 40,000 megawatt utility just in New York City, let alone the rest of the state. Um, we think utility-owned generation is a huge part of that because you, need, you, you just need all tools on the table to get as many renewable electrons built as quickly as possible. And we feel like not having renewable uh, utility-owned generation is an artificial constraint that's keeping us back. I think that there's also going to be really hard questions around how we transmit. And it's not all going to be offshore coming through the ocean, which in and of itself has environmental issues um, in terms of laying cable on the ground. But you are going to be bringing a lot of power lines um, through you know, suburban uh, New Jersey and New York to get to the city. Um, and, and those are going to be pretty hard conversations with communities about how to get those electrons here. I also think there's going to be an important conversation around how we consume. Um, and that's going to be questions of how much we consume, um, giving customers better choices on how they, how they consume it, better transparency into what they're using, um, time of use pricing that Dave mentioned, so that you know, right now you can run your dishwasher in the middle of a heat wave and it's the same, it's the same amount of money. Um, but we need to have the ability to incentivize people to not run their dishwasher during a heat wave and run it uh, at another time. Um, and, those, and we need to be able to give people those tools. We don't, they don't necessarily have them now. And then I think the other hard question is going to be how it's paid for. Um, these are not cheap investments. Um, the, and this grid that we are um, moving towards is, is, all these things we're talking about are not free. Um, and so getting the grid ready, getting, getting the transmission built, um, those are all things that customers are going to have to invest in. And we have to work together to, to guide those investments. Um, so I think it's a huge conversation um, that we all have to have with, with um, consumers, with, um, with, with the, um, utility advocates, the independent utility advocates, uh, our union, um, a lot of the stakeholders on, on different sides of the, of the fence. We all have to come to the table and figure out how we're actually going to do this. Right. I'm, I'm not going to ask any more questions because obviously all of those things could point in directions that we could go on for a long time. I appreciate your recognition of the need to drill down further. I hope we can find ways to keep doing that together. I'll just sort of underline and maybe make one distinction on what you said at the end because I do think we will need to find ways to vest consumers in this process. And whether that looks like a carbon tax or whether that looks like dynamic pricing, demand management is a piece of what's going to be required here. Um, and we need smart and thoughtful ways to do it. On the other hand, um, it can't be that, and I know you didn't mean to imply this, but just for the record, um, you know, that consumers are responsible for bearing the costs uh, of the transformation here. And, you know, that is why a lot of us are big supporters of a, of a Green New Deal model. And I just want to connect the dots because we're not going to be able to pay the cost of what you just described without substantial new resources to do it from somewhere. Um, and hopefully that will be in the form of a substantial and progressive and federal plan to help us. But if that doesn't come, then we're going to have to find some ways to do it locally and regionally as well. So, all right, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Up next, we have Heim Deutsch. Thank you, Chairs. My hair was turning gray sitting here waiting to ask a question. Um, so firstly, I just want to say that um, uh, I passed the bill uh, a year ago regarding um, uh, Department of Aging, doing outreach at senior centers, um, 
letting them know that if someone's in life sustaining equipment, you should call Con Edison. And I tried it myself. I called Con Edison and I was able to like uh, possibly register an address within like three minutes. So I'm encouraging everyone um, out there that if you know someone who's in life sustaining equipment, to make sure that they reach out to Con Edison and register their address, which is extremely important. Um, I also, um, uh, I am proposing a bill in the city council that would uh, mandate all elevators to have electric backup, that if an elevator gets stuck in a power outage, it should be able to go to the next floor, so this way people could get out safely. In addition to that, uh, there should be a battery backup for the lighting, so if you're stuck in an elevator with other people, you should have lights in the elevator. So I'm looking forward to working with you uh, on this bill to make sure it works for everyone. Um, so firstly, I just want to, uh, before I get into my question, I want to commend you in, in governmental uh, staff who's been extremely responsive. And I do receive the emails whenever there's a power outage, and uh, I use that information. I check the emails myself, my council emails, so I disseminate that information to uh, my constituents, whether it's uh, via Facebook or um, uh, having um, my staff calling people up, just to get that information across, which is extremely important. Um, so to my concern, um, I want to thank my colleagues and the chairs for bringing up many of the questions. But you mentioned before that um, uh, there are 2,600 customers uh, that are affected by the National Grid Moratorium. So I believe those numbers were already like three weeks ago. So um, I think those numbers have reached a higher number, probably closer to 3,000. So you did mention that short term, because uh, uh, Con Edison always projects um, like on different developments coming into the community and um, how the zoning is. Uh, with working with the Planning Commission, I hope. But um, long if, there's, if there should be a long-term moratorium, and I know that one restaurant that I know of that I've been working with in Crown Heights, they just um, switched, uh, they, just, they were forced to use electric because they couldn't get the gas turned on. So what is your projection, uh, number one, for the future if it's, if it's more than a short-term moratorium? And number two, that I understand Con Edison um, has no personal interest uh, in the Williams Pipeline, but how is Con Edison going to weigh in to uh, let the governor know, let the EDC know, and the Public Service Commission whether you support the Williams Pipeline or oppose the Williams Pipeline, that we need to come up with a resolution to um, have people turn to some ty other type of energy opposed to electric. Um, many businesses, um, uh, affordable housing, people are suffering each and every day. And if you take Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island, that is affected now, combine them all three, there are 10 million, uh, more than 10 million residents. So from the 10 million residents, from the 10 million plus residents, you have approximately, let's say, 3,000 people that are affected. So the conversation is really not, people are not talking about it. Because when you're talking about uh, more than 10 million people, this is a drop in the bucket. Um, so what is, how is Con Edison going to weigh in um, for the future of, of, um, of your electric grids and, and having this, having an excessive strain on the future? Okay. W with regard to the customers who may transfer for over, we don't we don't yet know how large that population population is. But again, we'll, we'll accept those uh, those applications as they come forward. And as I said, in the short term, I'm I'm certain we have sufficient capacity to take those customers on, and we can we can plan. We have an obligation to serve with our, our tariff with the state. You know, compels us to. We're, we're going to make sure we're going to put anything we need in place to secure electric service for those customers uh, further on down the road, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to be there uh, for them. How long this, this moratorium will last, we, we don't know. We don't know. So um, the question, if all 3,000 customers um, turn to electric, right, you could have restaurant owners, you could have developments, um, and every day you have more and more applications that are being put in. So in a month from now, it could be 4,000, it could be 5,000. We don't know. Um, if 
Con Edison had issues up until now with the grids, right? And especially in the summer when you're saying people should lower the usage. But you also have to remember in Brooklyn and other parts of the city, people are vacationing during the summer months. So they're not using as much, they're not using the electric. So imagine people stay home during the summer months, right? That power outage that we had several months ago would have been larger and it would have been really like um, a lot worse than, than it was. We, ad we adapt to changing conditions. Uh, we did so when the, uh, the city passed the, the uh, clean buildings law and we had to build that infrastructure for gas in, in the city to meet the conversion demand. And similarly, on the electric side, I think we'll be ready to, to meet this demand as it, as it comes on. Um, I, I, I don't see a problem with that. So you don't we'll see any... We'll build, yeah. we'll, be, we'll build the necessary infrastructure. So you don't see any problems whatsoever if everyone switches to electric? Not in the short term. We, we not, in, not in the short I'm talking Not for long. those 3,000 or so. You not for those 3,000 yeah. or so. So anything more than 3,000, um, then you would have to start thinking about it, right? Well, uh, that so, actually so leads into the discussion about electric. So shouldn't we, like, be proactive? Because uh, we don't know how long this moratorium is going to last. And to um, basically reach out to, to the state and say, listen, um, we could be in an electrical crisis, not just in a, in a gas crisis. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't we be proactive rather than reactive? So there's a, there's a couple of things there. Um, one is something you said, I just wanted to, I don't want to forget to say it. So one thing that I think would be uh, helpful with, um, with just in terms of continuing partnership with the council is we are actually not formally part of the um, ULERP process. So whenever someone, and I'm intimately familiar with this from my time at the Economic Development Corporation. So whenever you do an area-wide rezoning, there is an environmental impact statement that's done and there's consideration paid for, and I actually worked with Council Member Rose on one of these. There's a attention paid to schools, roads, um, water infrastructure that's necessary to facilitate, but there's not necessarily a conversation in that EIS about energy infrastructure. And so what ends up happening is that if it, in an area-wide rezoning happens, uh, we can pay attention to it based on our, 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 our presence in communities, but there's not necessarily a formal role for the energy or the, for the utilities in assessing the infrastructure needs that are necessary for an area-wide redevelopment. We would like to be much closer to that process. That would, because what happens now is we can keep track of an area-wide rezoning, but we don't really factor in the load until someone actually comes to us looking for a service letter. And so, so having a more formal look at energy infrastructure in an environmental impact statement, I think it's just something you said earlier triggered, uh, wanted to make sure we, we, I made that point that that's actually not happening now uh, in, a, in a formal way. In, but to your, the latter part of your question in terms of what are we doing with the state and proactive, so we meet with National Grid, we sort of plan the, organ, the it's called the joint utilities and essentially uh, they're planning for the gas needs. And then we're in constant conversations with the Public Service Commission um, on the gas issues in New York City and Westchester County. Um, so it's, it's, it, those conversations are constant. Um, so there's no formal need to like write a letter or formally advocate because they absolutely know the, the critical issues that are happening in the state with this system and our, the supply issues. And I think um, secondly, we are proposing a couple of projects in um, on one particular pipeline called a compression project um, on the Iroquois pipeline that services the Bronx and Queens. And the idea there is it's not a new pipeline, it's utilizing existing infrastructure. So you have a pipe that fits so much gas into it, you can upgrade the compressors all along the pipe and fundamentally squeeze more gas molecules into the same existing pipe. So without building a new pipe infrastructure, you can effectively deliver more capacity to the city. And that's something that we are, that would essentially benefit the Bronx and Queens. Um, so, and these are all projects that we're, these are, we're working on with the Public Service Commission um, to, to hopefully get approved um, to meet some of the, the gas issues. But 
So there's a lot of advocacy going on every day on these issues with So in other words, um, you're saying you are concerned about the future of the grids um, based on the moratorium. Oh, I'm sorry, and the last thing I was going to say is we are working with the city to answer your question. We are concerned, and we're working with the city and National Grid on a study that essentially says, what do you need to do to the grid to meet the demand that's going to come from people transitioning off of gas? Whether or not it's off of Con Edison gas or National Grid gas, what do you have to do? What investments do you have to make? Um, and so that's, we are concerned and that's why we we're working. We've been working with National Grid in the city for about a year on this study and we'll be done in June uh, of this coming year. We'll happy, happily come and brief the council on the findings of that study. But yes, we are concerned and we're actively working and planning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, I have to say I am really offended that there was no apology to Staten Islanders or any mention in this whole hearing about the service um, outages or disruptions to Staten Island. As you know, I'm sure there were outages all over Staten Island um, this summer, West Brighton, New Brighton, Stapleton, and parts of the East and South Shore, and they were recurring. Um, impacting, uh, maybe it's not as much as in the Manhattan or Brooklyn, but you know, it was significant, more than 5,000 or more residents in Staten Island. And so um, I'm interested to know what were the main causes of the outages this summer on Staten Island. Um, as I had been briefed uh, prior to the summer season and assured that um, that there would not be a problem, that we could sustain the load, um, and that uh, they had anticipated any issues that might have arise, arisen. Right, so um, yeah, we did experience, uh, you have my apology, we did experience some difficulties on, on uh, Staten Island. Customers uh, were out of lights. We, we lost, we had a, a unit substation uh, quantifier, Grant City, that, that put 5,000 customers out of light. We had to switch around that. Um, in each of the days going into the heat wave, we experienced several thousand outages uh, on our radial system, uh, overhead outages that had to be put back in place. And we did have a, uh, a concern at one of our substations, uh, and we placed uh, 18 generators. These are synchronous 2 megawatt generators that can uh, join uh, into our system to support load in case of an event. Uh, so Staten Islanders did, uh, did, did have impacts across the, uh, the heat wave, and uh, we, we regret those uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, but we did work hard to get people back in lights uh, throughout the Can you the explain to me why um, they were reoccurring, um, especially in the same area, especially since um, I understand we have sort of a, a radial load type system where um, I would think once it had been addressed, whatever the issue was, was addressed, that we shouldn't have um, sustained outages um, or disruptions to service in those same areas, but um, we had recurring shortages in those same, you know, areas. Right. With that unit substation out of service, we we did have uh, an impaired, uh, you know, network in that area, uh, which makes it more susceptible to outages. Uh, the the word the load, as I said before, is is trying to redistribute. So in addition to serving customers, those cables are doing additional work trying to redistribute that load. Any pre-existing defects, uh, perhaps a, a lightning strike, an open wire, which, which will open a, a small pinhole in the cable maybe a year or two before, very, very difficult to find. Uh, those can create oxidation pockets, which really are only going to be found in a, in a high load situation. And those things will, will come out as a heat wave progresses. Um, but we did, we did have plenty of staffing down at Staten Island. We did do everything we could to try to restore people as quickly as possible, but there were significant impacts, and I apologize. So now that um, we had the high load season, um, we, should have, um, we should have some markers as to where these issues exist, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what are the changes or improvements to the infrastructure that um, you anticipate, and is there a timeline um, to remediate these? 
problem. So uh, we've actually, we've invested in Staten Island each year. We've backboned uh, two of our 33 uh, um, KV feeders in that area. We continue to make that investment. It's actually an element in, in the rate case uh, we're discussing right now. Um, and we continue to, to, to work on that and make that investment. Um, we believe uh, improvements uh, have continued. Our, our um, uh, hot weather performance for uh, radial systems, open wire systems, has improved in each of the last five years, and we think it will continue to improve with continued investment. And um, we understood that the outages this summer were because of surges and, and the use and usage up an uptick it, an uptick in usage. Um, but we often have problems in the winter time because we have overhead lines. Um, is there any any anticipation that we'll have a problem with outages because of um, during the winter the trees fall, um, the wires are. Uh, we we have an aggressive tree trimming uh, uh, protocol. We. Uh, we spend money, a great deal of money in Staten Island as well as Westchester trimming trees. We cycle trim um, the, the feeders at least two, two to three years depending upon the voltage category they're in. Um, it's a pretty aggressive uh, trimming policy, but um, storms, particularly wind and uh, rainstorms, uh, will cause outages as uh, equipment is impacted by, by trees that come over. They're, they can't get to, to everything. Um, in this uh, rate case we're discussing right now, where there, there is going to be money available for danger tree uh, um, removal. This is private property trees that, um, that, that could threaten overhead wires. So we're trying to do more with regard to storm preparation. We've uh, continued to invest in storm hardening, and um, uh, the performance should, demonstrates that. Are there plans to um, put any of the lines underground? Not at this time, as, as I mentioned before, um, wholesale undergrounding of, uh, of overhead systems is uh, quite rare, and there's considerable costs involved, both for the municipality as well as individual customers who have to, have to bear the cost of those conversions. So at this time, no. Uh, we have done, in, in, through storm hardening, we have done some selective uh, uh, hardening projects, which, will, which will essentially allow us to isolate um, key pieces of infrastructure. Uh, for instance, we have had certain projects where we've, uh, we, we've allowed um, isolation of circuits so that we can keep, say, a, a supermarket in service, right, which is critical to customers in a, in a storm situation uh, so they can have access to, to groceries uh, if, if you have a, a power outage that might, you know, a big storm could have implications where people are out of lights for a few days. So new construction you're looking at? putting the wiring underground? Uh, well, so if you, if you look at Staten Island, um, th there are uh, zoning requirements. If we're going to do, if there's going to be an extension and it meets certain criteria, it's uh, like a residential subdivision, uh, most of that is required to go. And if it meets certain criteria, most of that goes in is what we call underground residential distribution. And it's essentially a radial system that is insulated and goes underground. Those are the green boxes you see sometimes on, on folks' lawns. And, and before, I talked about the unit cost of construction. So overhead would be $1. Traditional underground would be $10. Um, and, and URD would be about $3. So we, we do try to get these things um, into this URD profile if, if it meets the, the criteria under regulation. But a lot of subdivisions do go URD. And, and my last question is just, Staten Island is a pilot program for the smart meters. Um, is that? Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, so Staten Island is, is the place that we started, uh, essentially complete uh, with AMI installations. So uh, not Where? a pilot, all over it's the city. It's not a pilot. Right. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the Staten Island as a whole is done, going out to all the uh, boroughs, large percent complete in many areas. I think what you were referring to is, so we installed all the smart meters and that's totally done in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. I think what you're referring to is we are, we are doing a pilot on Staten Island on time of use pricing. Yes. So we are um, actively reaching out to customers um, right now or soon um, and giving, uh, it's, it's a fairly complex study and it's really meant to look at 
um, how people respond to time of use pricing, essentially, <coughs> or the, their desire to even do it in the first place, and if they uh, want to be energy advocates versus sort of passive uh, customers. Uh, and there's a lot of different things going on, but yes, there's a pilot going on in Staten Island that is essentially looking at and testing what programs are most effective um, for New Yorkers. And hours of usage. And yeah, so the idea there is it's some people will be able to opt in to a pilot where they can have energy, essentially we're studying, we're showing them what their energy usage is and giving them the tools to manage it. Um, there are some people who will have to opt out. Um, so we're studying different things there. We're also looking at um, making sure that Customers, they're, they're, they're essentially getting a guaranteed flat bill. So if, let's say, for example, that the program that they choose actually makes their bills go up, mm -hmm. we are holding them flat at their normal bill. Uh, it's really just a test to see. Um, so it's giving us more tools to see how, in, how cu customers respond to um, time of use pricing. Is everyone able to opt into that? Some, there's different test groups some people, the way it's designed is some people have to opt uh, in. First of all, not, everyone's get, not everyone is a part of the pilot, so there's a, certain groups and neighborhoods. Um, two, some people have to opt into it, so they get a mailer and says, here's this program, if you'd like to do this, please opt in. And there are some people who are getting notices that say, You've, this is your rate plan, if you don't, and explaining everything, and if you don't want that, you can opt out. And it wasn't determined by usage? The, the no, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's just mostly sort of by geographics, and, but it's not by usage. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, up next, we have uh, Mark Traeger from Brooklyn. Yes, the, the outer borough elected with, with a lot of patience. <laughs> Uh, before I get to, th so thank, thank the chairs for the leadership on, on this issue, a very timely hearing. Uh, before I get to my prepared questions, uh, I just want to follow up on something I, I think I heard. Uh, when did Con Edison first become aware that National Grid uh, was going to not issue new gas connections to Brooklyn, Queens residents? Sorry, when did we become first aware? When did you first become aware, yes. Um, as far as I know, we read about it in the press, um, and and they never called it a moratorium. But we we I think we heard. Uh, I basically didn't hear anything formally from National Grid, but other than in the press that they were issuing contingency letters. What prompted your meeting with National Grid and City Hall a year ago that you mentioned before in your testimony? Um. Our meeting with National Grid a year ago. I, I heard that a year ago, Con Edison, National Grid, and City Hall met to discuss a study. Oh, what, yeah. What, just was, the, what was the basis of that study? Oh, so we have been working with a National Grid and the city to fund uh, a study that's how to get the grid ready for electrification of heating load, and National Grid is part of that study. It, it's not about gas issues per se. The study has nothing to do with that. It's, it's just about how to meet yeah. the... I mean, this hearing is not about National Grid, but I will tell you that I find it appalling and unacceptable that the people most affected by National Grid's moratorium were the last to know because their lobbyists and their, and their, and their, and their folks in their circle said, well, we briefed Rebney or we briefed the, the mayor's office. I don't care about Rebney or the mayor's office. I care about the small businesses and residents in my district and across Brooklyn and Queens right now that do not have gas. We're building affordable housing for homeless veterans in my district, and there's a question about whether or not they're gonna have gas connection, people who serve this country. This is appalling. In the era of these energy companies with this greedy monopoly have, has, has got to come to an end. It is appalling, but we're here about Con Edison, and I want to just make sure I, I get to my, my questions. Now, um, do you have data with you uh, about the number of outages that let's just say, let's just say in the past year, forget five years, because this, this goes on, you know, Councilman Brennan, I, him and I in southern Brooklyn, the outer, outer borough, like Staten Island as well, 
experience these outages frequently. I, I think my colleague mentioned every summer or winter in, my, in parts of my district, it's every couple weeks. How many outages have you documented, for example, uh, in Bath Beach? By the way, Bath Beach is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, too, in case City Hall doesn't understand that. We're not Brighton Beach, we're Bath Beach. Some folks need to know the ge geography of their own city. Uh, how many outages has Bath Beach experienced? One, one, two, one, four, and there's a loop that goes into Coney Island as well. How many outages in this section in the past year? I would have to get back to you. I'm sorry. I would have to get back to you on the exact number. I, I have looked at the loop performance in that area. We've got the Cropsey Loop, the Gravesend Loop, and the Coney Island Loop. And uh, I would tell you that the Coney Island Loop and the, and the, uh, and, and the Cropsey Loop uh, require some attention. What we're going to do, because uh, performance has declined in, in the last 18 months, and what we're going to do um, in, in, in short order is we're going to one side those loops, we're going to thermograph them, and we're going to go through and really take a good look at the construction. Um, Cropsy Loop, uh, as you know, there's a, there's a large public improvement project going on down at Nep Neptune and Mermaid. That's where we had to transfer our or all our facilities uh, to one side of the street. That, that in effect, has impacted the reliability of the loop. Um, we'll, we'll have to have to take a look at that um, a little closer once the, the new uh, construction is up. But um, I would say those two, those two loops require uh, some attention. We, we have had outages in that section as well as uh, Seagate. We've had generators on twice this year where we had to replace uh, a step-down transformer and an underground transformer that, that failed. We've, uh, we've lost a, a, a riser. We've had a smoking manhole uh, in, in that area. Uh, so it, it, it does counsel or require. Do you have a, first of all, I have, this is the first time I've heard Con Edison acknowledge the depth of the problem in my district. And I want to appreciate that acknowledgement because in the past, I will tell you that folks from your company have tried to suggest that my residents having backyard barbecue parties with balloons skimming through an overhead wire knocks down 3,000 people's homes of power. If that is true, that is outrageous, and that is frightening how delicate and sensitive our infrastructure system is in New York City. But that doesn't pass the lab test to me. So I appreciate this is the first time I'm hearing a serious acknowledgement about the depth of the problem. Because I will tell you, sir, that almost every other week, and I'm not exaggerating, I have an email thread from my constituents, almost every other week, there's an email about an outage. Now, does Con Edison have a threshold uh, as far as what determines an outage? Does it have to be a certain time period? Because sometimes the outages might last 20 minutes. Sometimes the outage might last two hours. Uh, do you have a threshold that, that determines? Uh, reportable to, the, to the, our regulator is uh, anything beyond five minutes. All right, anything that's out for five minutes. There have been times when I was shopping at the local stop and shop on, on Cropsey Avenue when the power went out. And I called your company, and the person did not even know that there was an outage in my neighborhood. The traffic lights were out. So all the things we heard about Manhattan experiencing, which is also horrific, very bad, we experience on a very frequent basis in southern Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And what happens, sir, is that the local police precinct has to dedicate manpower to the intersections rather than making sure our neighborhoods are safe. They have to do traffic control every time this happens, whether it lasts 20 minutes or it lasts an hour or two hours. That's number one. Number two. In this Cropsy Loop, you have residences, as mentioned before, seniors on life-saving uh, energy devices. You have a school for children who are disabled. And every single time I have to respond to calls, when is, this gonna when is the power going to come back? This is, this is every other, almost every other week. And I am not going to tell my constituents that maybe it's their helium balloons that are causing problems. That's outrageous and insulting. So I actually would like to have data from your company about the number of outages, which has saved the last 18 months. This has been going on for years prior to Coney Island Construction, by the way. But I would like to have data 
on how many outages because that, that's an accountability tool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, and, and what I'd like to do is report on you, uh, report to you on, uh, on what we're going to do uh, to make repairs and remediate the situation. Um, the Southeast Bronx uh, network, that overhead area, actually that is a, a um, actually performs better than the average. And those two loops I mentioned have to climb below the average. And we have work to do there. And I, I apologize for that performance. And I hope to do better. And I appreciate, um, I appreciate that apology and recognition. And, and do you have a time frame on when these repairs can start and, and when will they end? Uh, I can't tell you when they'll end. I can tell you I'll need about a month to get, to get together a plan. We'll probably make some repairs before that's over. But I, I, I think I, I, the best pay, uh, plan would be for me to report to you at regular intervals, let you know how things are going and what we, what we plan to do to make it, make it better. I can't eliminate every outage. And again, that public improvement project is, is a bear uh, to deal with, but, but we, we can definitely do better down there. We have to do better. Yes, well, I appreciate that answer much more than about helium balloons and squirrels. So I, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Um, now, last two, two questions. And I'm not sure, forgive me if this was touched upon earlier, I was at a, I was at a different hearing. Um, has there been any con contact or any communication with the New York State Public Service Commission about what happened uh, in, in Brooklyn? Have, have there been any conversations and about uh, can you share uh, yes. what they have been like? Uh, they are going to conduct a, um, uh, I think, a vigorous investigation. Um, we've had conference calls with them. We've had uh, numerous interrogatories uh, sent back and forth uh, between the two entities. Um, I believe I'll be traveling next week up to Albany uh, for a conference uh, to give them a briefing, uh, much like the briefing you've had today. Uh, but we, we would anticipate a full investigation that may take, um, I can't tell you how long that would take, but it'll be, it'll be a public report uh, issued by the Public Service Commission, and, um, and I think it'll, it'll be quite comprehensive. Uh, to follow up on that, one of the items that I mentioned in my complaint about the outage is that, you know, I understand that if an outage occurs in Midtown Manhattan, that becomes national news. Uh, an outage like that in my part of, of the world, which happens frequently, is, is covered by local news, but certainly not citywide or, or, or national news. But I have small businesses that purchase seafood that, have, that want to sell their product. I have working class people that just went sh food shopping. And the health code and a lot of the guidelines say, if you don't have power, even if, you know, if a two or three hour outage, it could be a problem with regards to food storage. Now your policy, if, correct me if I'm wrong, the threshold to qualify for reimbursement for food spoilage is much more than two or three hours. Am I correct? The policy says that, yes. Now, I think that has to be revisited, particularly in neighborhoods that see frequent outages. When you have on a day, two, three hours, Two days later, two, three hours, there are people who don't chance it, mm -hmm. especially if you buy fish or, or seafood, they don't chance it, they throw it out. The, 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 the Parkview Diner on Cropsey Avenue, which has some of the best pancakes in New York City, they don't chance it, they throw it out. Mm -hmm. These are working class people. They can't keep doing this. But your reimbursement threshold, I think, is uh, really just not cognizant of the fact that the outages occur in these, in these pockets of two, three hours at a time, almost every other day. So do you have any comment on making some sort of an accommodation for neighborhoods like mine that see these frequent outages in these pockets of two, three hours? We, we do look at the uh, claims on a case-by-case -case basis, um, individual claims from, from residential individuals. I, I don't know that we take such a firm line on with the 12-hour requirement. Um, I, I think we, we, we may uh, be more liberal in paying those claims. Uh, commercial businesses, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, they have to consider outages uh, in, in their business plan um, and, and think through how they might, you know, uh, handle the occasional outage from time to time. Yeah, well, I will appreciate if you actually follow up on, the, on my request to make accommodations for working class people to get their claims reimbursed.
because it's not right for them to throw out their food shopping every time this happens. And respectfully, our commercial businesses, when a small business owner opens up shop, that's with the assumption that they have power. You know, they pay their taxes, they pay their fees, they pay their bills. They are right to assume that there's going to be energy. And, and so that's, uh, that's something. Now, the final piece. We heard a lot today about preparation. I was, uh, prior uh, to the, our current chair, who's doing a great job, Chair Brennan of the Resiliency Committee, my prior role in the council, I was chair of the, of the Recovery Resiliency Committee. I was very much involved in the city's efforts to push FEMA and to push the federal government uh, with regards to uh, monies, money for Sandy recovery and resiliency efforts in New York City after Superstorm Sandy. I was very much involved in the effort to get money for Coney Island Hospital to rebuild, to be, be more resilient, and NYCHA to rebuild and be more resilient. FEMA actually required the city to elevate their infrastructure, mm -hmm. their boilers and mechanical infrastructure. Is there any conversation that we're having with City Hall and our federal officials about trying to uh, apply for federal funding in this infrastructure bill that hopefully takes shape in Congress so we could apply for, for resiliency dollars to make our energy grid and system more resilient. Because I am hearing that it's very expensive in terms of the movement of the overhead wires. I, I acknowledge that that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely costly initiative. But that cost should not be on the burdens of working class people who experience the outages. And number two, if there's ever an effort to, to, to address this issue, it will be passed on to them in, in the form of, of rate increases. This is a federal issue, not just a local issue. Is there any discussion, had there been any discussions with City Hall or any members of Congress or, or U.S. Senators about our energy grid, infrastructure, resiliency efforts in the infrastructure bill making its way in Congress? Um, I'm not aware of any specific conversations with City Hall about applying for federal funds. Um, to just to be direct answer to your question, I, I'm not aware of it. I don't think we are necessarily opposed to it. Um, it's something we can look into, but I don't know of any conversations going on right now about specific grant applications. Right, because you won't get if you don't ask. I'm not saying that there's a guarantee it's going to happen, but you have to ask. Uh, and I do think this is a resiliency issue. This is a public safety issue. Our, in, our, our infrastructure grid, uh, energy grid, is very vulnerable. And you, your company can't do it alone. So I really do believe that there has to be an effort to make this an application to the federal government to make our system more resilient. Um, and that would be my, my last appeal and message. And I plan to follow up with Congressman about the issues that pertain to my district. And I thank the chairs for their leadership and their time. All right. Um, so I'm just going to come back for a few questions to sort of follow up. Um, this 40,000 megawatt number, um, that's the first time I've heard it. Um, I know that's sort of a, it's a bit of a long afternoon already, morning into afternoon, but sort of what went into the consideration for coming up with a 40,000 megawatt number? Was like, was, you know, solar, was solar PV thought about and how that's going to sort of reduce that number? How are retrofitting buildings? I mean, is, where is that number coming from, the, the 40,000 megawatt number? It's not a firm number. It's, um, so right now, as I said, we are around 13,000 megawatts. And the, the, one of the main points of the study we're working on with, with the city uh, is getting closer, getting a more refinement around that number. Right now, what we're, and my phrase was, it's up to. So it's not a firm number. It's uh, okay, hopefully less. It came less. to me that was almost like a fact. No, no, sorry. It's, it's up to 40,000. And the idea is that so if we're at 13 now, our concern and our thought is that the grid as a winter peaking utility mm -hmm. either doubles or triples uh, in its uh, usage. And a lot of that's going to depend on uh, the technology that comes out in terms of getting people onto heat pumps, onto geothermal, affordability of geothermal, adoption of those technologies, and our ability to penetrate uh, on energy efficiency, so if we can, if we can, you know, if it's it's going to be 40, if a lot of those things aren't working well, and it's going to be less if we can get energy efficiency and more effective units and s uh, smarter energy usage. So it's 
The 40 is like our worst case scenario. Probably worst if, case. If every yeah. building in New York City goes electric and everyone's running their appliances 24 hours a day with impunity, right? It's basically if you take it, basically the 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 triple comes from if you took just what's heated now with natural gas and made it electricity plus growth over uh, those th those uh, however many 28 years. Um, it could be a triple. I mean, I just think but, we need to have a conversation. Yeah, about, I, absolutely. About coming up with that number in a way that is not uh, sort of punitive to the things that we have to do to fight climate change, right? right. And I think that throwing out that number is a, a number that is sort of trying to make folks do a double take. And I think we need to have a conversation about yes, we're going to certain grow certain sectors. We need to move away from fossil fuels. Here's how we do it, and come up with that with, with that sort of a, a harder number based on more fact and not just sort of projection. Yeah, and it's it's not a it's not an official number that we're it's it's and that's really going to be the point of the studies to figure that out. And I'll just say lastly, um, you know when it comes to Westchester, I know there's been a moratorium in Westchester, there's been over, over 8800 heat pumps installed in Westchester, over 300 uh, heat pumps uh, installed in uh, in the Bronx alone. So I think when we talk about moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure, that can be a potential solution that we're not talking about. And I, th I believe it's a false choice. I mean, I still have not got uh, any sort of info from National Grid. I, I sat here on this, well, in Raphael's chair, um, about four months ago asking for data, and I still haven't received that data. So uh, until such time I, I receive that data, I will still believe that this is a ploy and an opportunity to sort of flex muscle and punish the people of the city of New York because they did not get their way on the Williams Pipeline. Um, and I think it's time we start talking about renewable energy alternatives instead of saying we have to sort of get more gas hookups. I think that's the solution we have to look to is how we move to renewable energy and not be sort of dependent upon uh, these you know, sort of fossil fuel options. I think it's a false choice. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back to uh, Chair Espinal. Thank you, uh, Chair. With that said, I want to uh, give uh, Councilman Peter Koo an opportunity to ask a few questions. So I want to thank uh, the leadership from Connors and uh, having the patience to sit down here for continually uh, three hours now. Yeah, and I have the <laughs> leadership to leave and come back to ask you a question. Uh, my my question is related to the. To the, to, to, not to the electric problem, but for the gas problem. Recently, a lot of con my constituents, with the small business people or, or, or like developers, when they, uh, uh, when they, when they, they uh, open a new restaurant, uh, it takes them months uh, to get the gas to come into their restaurants. And finally, they couldn't wait. They, stay, they, they use electric to open the stores, right? But, no, and also apartment buildings too, in Amherst, in, you know, it's not in a in very far remote areas, just in the neighborhood, the uh, downtown fashion area, near fashion. Uh, my question is, how come it's so hard to bring in gas? You know, we are not in Africa or some other uh, uh, remote countries, no. This is the most developed cities in the whole world. And, and you tell me, you know, we have a problem to supply gas uh, to, to new customers. And especially some, like, some, some places, when they demolish the building, the building there had gas before, but mm -hmm. once you demolish it, you build a high rise, and they, they can put gas to come in. So I want to know why, and then, then how you can improve it. Certainly we can make improvements. In some cases, to, to, to bring gas in, particularly for, for larger buildings, we have to do reinforcement, which takes time, takes planning. Um, and, and again, it, it depends on the time, time we have to prepare for those, uh, those buildings to come online. If you get those, uh, those sorts of concerns and inquiries, you, you can contact me directly. I, I can get it over to the gas department. I used to work in energy services. We, we dealt with a lot of issues where we're trying to match uh, businesses and, and, and customers coming online, and, and we have to move our plans around to accommodate customers. That's what we do. Um, so, so we can do better. Uh, but if you can get me those specific issues as they arise, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do what we can. And just one thing, this is um, one area that, in addition to being highly regulated by the Public Service Commission, um, we are inter intricately intertwined with city agencies on a number of different levels. And so 
to the extent, for example, the, that um, someone has to have something reinforced, for example, that might mean we have to go through DOT to open the street. Um, and so uh, that's one way we sort of are intertwined with the city. Uh, I think second is, uh, and that's through the Department of Transportation. Uh, and then I think secondly, we obviously work very closely with the Department of Buildings, and we can't turn on anyone's gas until the Department of Buildings has has cleared it. And so that's another partnership we have with the city that uh, in, in the case of uh, you know, a customer that needs reinforcement um, new gas for new gas service, uh, it requires a great deal of partnership with the city to get it done. So there's no such uh, stated policy from your company saying that you don't take any more new customers for gas. There's no such thing, right? Not in New York City. Not in New York City, not for mm. the foreseeable future. So as long as they have department building uh, uh, permit, I mean, even the restaurant is completed. Mm -hmm. But somehow they they waiting for gas for four months. They they had to pay rent, they, so they had to open the restaurant. So you know, they use electric to <laughs> to to power all these uh, appliances. And we all know gas is more powerful than electric. You no, know, yes. even in our own homes, we we have gas uh, uh, washers, right? When you want washing machine gas or drying machine right. or wash, if the gas is much more efficient and gas heat, so. For a whole apartment building, you say there's no heat and no, no gas. It's, it's terrible. Absolutely. If you can give me, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. If you can okay. give me this location, I'll, I'll look into it. All right, we'll thanks. Because we really do not, we do, do not want to not serve. Hmm. All right, uh, thank you. A large customer like that. Thank you. All right, well, with that said, uh, you're free to go. I want to call it the next panel. Yeah. Huh? Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and if possible, we would love to have Con Edison uh, to have a rep here to listen to the testimony. Dr. Yuri Dorkin, Assistant Professor from NYU. Richard Berkeley, Public Utility Law Project. You, you can begin your testimony. Just state your name for the record. Uh, make sure your mic is on. Can you hear me now? Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share some recommendations here on how we can make the power grid here in New York more efficient. And I would like to begin with a phrase that stuck in my head yesterday. CEO of Connecticut said that um, it's impossible to guarantee 100% reliability when you operate such a complex engineered system. And while it's true, I'm surprised that the CEO failed to mention that when you cannot guarantee 100% reliability, what you need to make sure that your recovery actions following a major outage are robust. That's something which is of foremost importance and that's, I believe, is something which Conedison failed to address in their practice. There are four reasons that I'm going to be talking about. The first one is that resiliency is not implicitly incentivized. And I'll give you a very simple example. First of all, not every outage is considered as a major outage, regardless that people are without electricity. According to the program called Ele Electric Service Reliability Performance Mechanism, uh, the outage is considered as large by Con Edison if only more than 15% on every distribution network is affected, 15% of the consumers. And the interesting, that even if the large outage occurs based on this ridiculous standard by Con Edison, the charge imposed on Con Edison, according to this policy, is $5 million. So let's take example of the July 13th event in Manhattan. 72,000 customers, which is approximately 200 people on the customer's premises were affected. So essentially, the penalty imposed on Con Edison was $25 per affected person. When the penalty is so low, the decision 
of the executive in charge is not to invest in resiliency. In this case, when you only have to pay $25 per person, the decision is you do it. You shed load, you curtail consumption because it's the most economically efficient action in that case. And another thing, basically it was a nationwide event when Con Edison didn't get any when there was a blackout in Manhattan, right? And they paid $5 million in penalty. Only $5 million out of $1.5 billion reported in their net income. The other interesting thing, which is not being explicitly discussed, is that even though the event in Manhattan affected six distribution grids, meaning that customers were disconnected in six distribution grids, only penalty was imposed only for the power outages in three distribution networks out of six. Three out of six. Why? Because according to this definition, the outages in the remaining three were not considered large, even though people were impacted. So the problem is that resiliency is not incentivized by the current practice and the penalty are laughable. So what needs to be done here, we need to change the regulatory framework so that Con Edison doesn't have the capability of cementing on its role as a monopolist in power delivery because we have competition in supply and very often delivery related concerns are being exploited so that um, Con Edison can maintain their bottom line. What could be the solutions? First, and it was mentioned by the gentleman over there, it's introducing high fidelity electricity pricing, whether through advanced pricing mechanism or through distribution of locational marginal prices that recognize locational, temporal, stochastic, and behavioral attributes of electricity production. And we need to do a better job in removing deliberately motivated entry barriers for third-party electricity suppliers and for increasing customer and autonomy. Introducing high fidelity pricing will do this job. Uh, Speaker Johnson, I believe, said that, um, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, he mentioned that uh, basically uh, we have to be more flexible on how we supply electricity, and that's exactly what that would achieve. And go Governor, uh, not Governor, Mayor de Blasio mentioned that probably we should have a, private, a public company running our wires. Uh, that's a valid point, but introducing competition would be more feasible, I believe, because in this case, uh, customers would have a choice. Internalizing the choice of customers would be important. So the problem is that Con Edison is a monopolist and it doesn't have any competitor. In my final thoughts, I would like to point on something that the gentleman from Con Edison said earlier today, that they don't collect social demographic information about their customers. And the reason for that was to prove their point that they don't discriminate people based on their so social demographic attributes, which is a great thing. But the problem is that if they don't have have social demographic information, they cannot internalize local sensitivities which drastically vary across the city into their decision. For example, people of different cultures, different religions, different socioeconomic factors, they differently tolerate interruptions in the electricity supply. So the decision that the Con Edison people made based on technical reasons to shut down the electricity, preemptively shut down electricity supply in Brooklyn. It didn't account for cultural sensitivities. So what I suggest is that Con Edison should lead an outreach, probably with assistance from the council and from the city hall in general, to understand what people in different neighborhoods of the city expect of their electricity supply preference, right? If it's an ability to tolerate a collusion of a balloon, let be it. In some, it would be observance of some other reasons. But in my final remark, I would like to say that based on my input as an expert, I believe the, this committee in general, when such complex issues are discussed, uh, you personally would benefit from having a panel of experts that includes not only academics like me, but there is a, um, a lot of engagement from U.S. national laboratories, from professional organizations that can give you technical advice on which questions to ask. Because honestly, I feel that people with expertise who were sitting behind this desk before me, they were able to sort of cut the corners and avoid answering some questions directly just because they were able to provide meaningless but technically sound answers. So I believe you would benefit honestly from uh, having experts on your side asking and grilling them on the questions that they don't want to answer. Thank you. Um, thank you to the chairs, thank you to the council, um, to the council leadership, and of course to public advocate Williams. 
My name is Richard Berkeley. I'm the executive director of the Public Utility Law Project of New York. We're a 40-year-old not-for-profit public interest law firm and consumer protection organization. We were founded to fight against runaway increases in the cost of energy and to provide an independent voice for utility consumers and to have an independent entity that protects them, which may be of uh, some relationship to being here today. We are also committed to providing direct services to low income and the working poor New Yorkers and New York City residents. We intervene in utility rate cases, such as the existing Con Edison rate case and the National Grid New York City, formerly Brooklyn Union, and the National Grid Long Island rate case. So we think a lot about the interplay between the two moratoria, Con Edison soft moratoria in New York City, which uh, Council Member Ku stumbled upon, and then also the other issues um, relating to creeping electrification. We've taken part in most of the major rate cases in New York over time, and we have also been involved in investigations into major electric outages, um, such as in the city in reverse order, the Superstorm Sandy investigations and the subsequent Moreland Commission inquiry, the 2006 Long Island City and Westchester blackouts, the 1999 Washington Heights blackout, and the 1977 blackout. My predecessor was a key member of the Moreland Commission and of the Western Queens Assembly Task Force investigations and to my knowledge um, provided a, a professional help to members of the council when asked. All of which brings me to today and the topic of the hearing, which is the reliability of Con Edison. But as the professor next to me pointed out, reliability is not the only important question. Resilience is as important in question with a utility like Con Edison. The company has said yesterday in front of the state legislature and today in front of you that it is the most reliable utility in the United States. And looking at the numbers on paper, um, that is not untrue. But reliability is not the only question. And particularly in New York, when the consequences of Con Edison having a failure are so much higher than they are elsewhere, you have a right, and the citizens of New York City have a right to expect more from them. Merely being better than everyone else is not good enough. They need to be as good as you need them to be. Electric is about economic development. Electric is about health, safety, and welfare. Electric is about quality of life. Electric is about livability. And as the company said in more detail yesterday, but slightly today, there are large numbers of customers who are what are called LSE, or life-saving equipment customers. These are people the company knows will die if the electric is out. But there are also people who are called um, customers with serious and chronic medical conditions. These are people that the company has not judged will die if there's no electric, but a medical professional has said that their medical condition in a doctor's expert opinion will be substantially harmed by the loss of either gas or electric. The company does not do a very good job of keeping track of those people. None of the utilities do in New York, and we talk about that with them, and we push them to do better when we're in rate cases like we are now with Con Edison. You all know the story of what happened in Manhattan. Um, we heard today from the council members, uh, not as much, unfortunately, from the company and the news media about what happened in the outer boroughs in July. But there are two different types of events that occurred. The first was the one in Manhattan. And the company raced to try and give answers, because it knew that it was going to end up in front of you and in front of the state legislature, in front of the Public Service Commission, and if Senator Schumer has his way, um, also in front of the federal energy regulators. So they tried to come up with an answer. And in the first couple of days, they gave you four different answers as to what happened. The thing that's important to know is, first, there was a system failure that led to the outage. Second, the outage spread, because even though their network system, the underground system in which they've invested so much money, and which is what costs so much money for ratepayers in the city of New York, it's designed to stop failures from spreading to other networks, and that didn't work. And from at least the early reports, and we'll find out more as the investigations continue, the company's investigation, your investigation, and the state's investigations, it sounds very like, from the outside, the type of failover problem that they had in Long Island City in 2006 and in Washington Heights in 1999. Each time there's been a hearing like this in front of this council, and I've been to two of the last uh, four of them, and there have been hearings at the federal, I'm sorry, at the state level and in front of the Public Service Commission, the company has been asked what the problem was. It has reported upon the problem and it has been ordered to do certain things to fix it. Earlier you heard the, the speaker say, you promised you would spend X amount of millions of dollars to replace 
these perhaps not obsolescent, but certainly replaced as technology has passed by safety portions of your network. And if you look at the company's records, and there's some very good reporting in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times about this, where they took the company's capital request from rate cases and then expenditure records from years later, they saw that a lot of the money the company requested wasn't spent. Now, let's be honest. The company makes decisions like that all the time. It asks for a certain amount of money in a rate case, and then something may come up in the middle of the three years or two years between one rate case and the next. And so it decides to spend its money differently. But I think what you, the council, have been saying today, and I think what I heard yesterday from the state legislature, is that it's insufficient to simply trust the company in these periods. And that what you need, among other things, and I think um, the speaker asked for this fairly clearly, is you need the company or perhaps some joint investigation to sit down and compare all the records of the company's requested capital and its actual expense records on the capital over time, perhaps at least as far back as the 1999 blackout, but certainly at least as far back as the 2006 blackout. Because Con Edison's system failures occur essentially at the same time of year every time with slight variations when it's things that are outside of their control, like a double northeaster uh, or a superstorm Sandy. But when it is just the system failing because of the heat, which is something their system is designed as well as any system to tolerate, what we're seeing is the failure of business as usual to deal with a new normal, as we like to call it. The company knows, as well as any utility in the United States, that climate change is real. New Yorkers know that, as well as anyone. But the company needs to take more steps to invest in resiliency, as the professor said next to me, which is it, it knows that sections of its grid are going to break from time to time. There are a whole bunch of reasons for that, which I won't go into now. But those breakages in certain sections of the grid should not bring other sections of the grid down. And that's a very important thing. And the company showed us failures in that plan. And it's been being told over and over again after the major outages and four major outages in the last 20 years in New York. It's, I'm sorry, in the last 40 years in New York. Uh, it's been told over and over again, invest in resiliency, invest in reliability. The city, the state have been very clear about saying you must be the most reliable utility in the world. Wall Street demands it. A city that at one point had almost a third of all the elevators in the world demands it. The subways demand it. And the fact that the city is graying and that we have more seniors and in our fiscally challenged areas, that we have more people with serious and chronic medical conditions, they demand it too. But you've also been demanding each time there's a public hearing like this that the company become more resilient and that a failure in one part of the grid should not take down other parts of the grid. Listening to it from the outside, and we'll find out more as we investigate, the situation that occurred where the company decided to depower Brooklyn was the same situation that happened in Long Island City 13 years ago where they didn't depower. Now, they're correct. In Long Island City, it ended up in a much longer and difficult restoration. In Brooklyn, perhaps that was the right decision. We won't know until we look into it in more detail. But one of the things that you pointed out today and that the state legislature pointed out yesterday is that, quite honestly, the company sucks when it comes to actually telling its customers what it's going to do and when it's going to do it. Each time there's been a major outage, you and the state have told the company that it has to communicate better. One of the best examples of this is when LIPA collapsed in Superstorm Sandy, and there is lengthy discussions in the Moreland Commission report about what the company must do to tell all the stakeholders, the businesses, the state level, the city level, the municipal level officials, that you should all be informed. Con Edison does some of that, but what it's doing is outsourcing its duty to talk to its customers to you. When it says, we told OEM, and then it's OEM's problem to tell people, when they say, we told you, and then you have to tell your constituents, I think it's pretty obvious from watching National Grid's behavior in the last couple of months that when the company wants to communicate to people, it's able to communicate on a one-on-one -on -one basis. National Grid took email addresses that its customers had given it for other purposes and told them to lobby you. Con Edison, which also has email addresses, could as easily have told people to the extent they still had email service, this is what's going to happen next in your neighborhood. We're going to shut off the grids. Get ready whatever get ready means, but that's another question for another day. I had a whole bunch of prepared remarks. I'm not going to issue any of them today um, because we're, it's late in the day, and I know at some point you're going to want to um, go back and think about this. So let me make a couple of observations and, and put forward a couple of questions, I think, that the council has to ask. First, I think this should only be the first of a series of ongoing hearings and an investigation 
into the behavior of the company. Again, this is about reliability, resilience, and the operation and management of the company. Most importantly, as your environmental chair, and as all three chairs have said today, the company has to be looking at the future. No one doubts that it's getting hotter. No one doubts that it's getting wetter. No one doubts that there will be more extreme weather events. The company has to have a plan to do better in all these circumstances, and business as usual simply won't cut it. So among the questions that you have to ask the company are, first of all, when did it make the decisions to not prudently invest in X, such as replacing all the failing relays, as opposed to spending it on something else? When did it make the decision, uh, or I should say, when should it have made the decision to begin preparing for electrification? It's pretty clear from where the National Grid moratorium is going that there's going to be substantial electrification in New York. At one time, I would have said to you that their grid could take it, but this is a company that is having trouble during the period of the year that its system is designed to operate at peak under. When we switch large sections of residential and businesses in New York City to electrification for the winter, you have a system that is not designed to do its hardest work in the winter. They're going to have to design that from scratch, and that's going to cost an awful lot of money, and the ratepayers are going to pay for it in the end. So it's important to know what that is ahead of time and to figure out if there's a better way to come up with that money. There are a whole bunch of other questions um, that I think the council should ask, and in fact, what I'll do is I'll submit them to your staff, um, since some of them came from listening to your questions today and some of them came from yesterday in front of the state legislature. I would also observe that, um, well, let me, let me say one or two more things. First, preparing for climate change is as important as you have said, but one of the things that the company hasn't spoken a lot about, although it does say that it regards its customers as very important, which is only accurate and, and correct, all of the measures to avert problems from climate change, all of the measures to move to more, 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 excuse me, to move to more renewable energy will cost money. Right now, almost 40% of the city can't afford to pay their bills on a monthly basis. You have something close to 40% of women-headed households with children present um, that qualify for free lunch, and actually 100% of the school district in New York gets free lunch, although a lot of that is the city's money. But there are huge numbers of New Yorkers who can't pay these bills now. All of the money that's going to be necessary to be spent on reliability and resilience and preparing for a more flexible system for climate change is going to go to the bottom line. And so that's something that has to be planned and implemented. We can't avoid spending to avert the problems from climate change. We can't avoid spending to get more reliability and more resilience. But you can plan. And one of the ways to do that is to make the company become more transparent as much as possible. I advocate that the council take part in trying to get more ordinary New Yorkers into rate cases. That's one of the things that I work on on a statewide basis with my organization. So let me stop there, and I, I think we both would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. No, good stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it, and we'll take it all into account. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. Appreciate it. Uh, next panel, we have Anel Hernandez from New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. We have Lee Asishin, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name. You can correct me once you're up there from Sane Energy Project, Kim Frasek from Sane Energy Project, and Gustavo Gordillo from New York City Democratic Socialists of America. It's good to see you all. Um, before you begin, anyone can begin. Just state your name uh, before you give testimony. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Chairperson Constantinides, uh, Brandon, Espinal, and me members of the City Council. I just want to say that I appreciate the energy that everybody brought uh, to the hearing today. I think it's important to hold uh, Con Ed accountable, so thank you for that. Uh, my name is Anel Hernandez. I'm the Associate Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. We are a citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. Climate justice is based on the principle that frontline communities are most vulnerable to climate change and therefore must play an integral role in planning for the renewable and regenerative energy economy. 
These are communities where climate vulnerabilities intersect with historic patterns of environmental burdens, many of which could be ameliorated through equitable energy policies and strategic investments. As utility ratepayers, members of these communities have financially contributed to existing energy efficiency and renewable energy programs in New York, only to encounter barriers to their own participation or programs that ultimately fail at systemically addressing the root causes of energy insecurity and energy poverty. The massive systems change required to stave off dangerous climate change impacts requires a consideration of these unique vulnerabilities. Extreme heat will undoubtedly exacerbate energy inequities. Low-income communities and communities of color also, also face disproportionate climate risks. Um, for example, New York City's 12 most heat vulnerable neighborhoods are predominantly high poverty areas where the residents are majority people of color. This assessment is based on the New York City Heat Vulnerability Index, which summarizes factors associated with adverse health effects and identifies neighborhoods with higher risks for heat-related deaths and consists of environmental metrics, poverty rates, and race demographic proven to be strong indicators of heat risk. Furthermore, heat vulnerable neighborhoods and high poverty areas also face additional overlapping vulnerabilities. In central Brooklyn, one of New York City's most heat vulnerable areas, Con Edison, has projected an energy shortfall necessitating demand reductions through its Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program. For years, we have warned of the vulnerabilities in the BQDM that may result in brownouts and blackouts. While Con Edison is expected to reach and exceed its energy demand reduction targets with a renewed commitment of 200 million ratepayer funds for demand reduction measures, the BQDM program only provided limited opportunities for residents. Despite residents making the majority of customers in the BQDM area, residential programming so far has been limited mainly to light bulb replacements. Furthermore, New York City is home to 16 peaker plants, many with multi multiple generating units, both publicly and privately owned. These highly polluting fossil fuel power plants known as peakers fire up in the South Bronx, Sunset Park, and other communities of color on the hottest days of the year when air quality is at its worst, and sensitive populations are warned to stay indoors. Peakers then spew even more harmful emissions into neighborhoods already overburdened by pollution. This outdated, inequitable, and inefficient system for meeting peak demand is ripe for transformation. All of New York City's privately owned peakers have been in operation for over 45 years and utilize old technology without upgraded pollution controls. Over the past 10 years, by public estimates, these New York City peaker plants have taken in about $4 billion of what are called capacity payments, just to sit there and run infrequently with some units operating no more than a few hours a year to keep the grid operating. Local New York City ratepayers pay out of their electric bills for these capacity payments, and all of this is on top of Con Ed's proposed um, rate case increase. Many of these plants, particularly the largest, oldest, most polluting plants, are owned by out-of-state private developers taking in billions of dollars in wealth out of these communities. These billions of dollars could instead be used in local investments for community solar and storage that could meet these peak demand needs, reduce electric bills, and provide resilient power, um, which would help avoid the impacts of blackouts like the one that hit Manhattan and Brooklyn this summer. Renewable and resilient energy systems will advance energy democracy, reduce energy cost burdens, strengthen the resiliency of communities, and capture the benefits that community solar and storage installations can deliver. Con Ed must, not, must ensure not only that its grid is resilient to extreme weather, but also that there's a plan to modernize and prepare for the new influx of large-scale offshore wind, distributed generation, and community solar throughout the city. Right now, they are not prepared for the renewable energy future. The Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which legislated commitments to eliminate fossil fuel emissions in New York State by 2050, make it imperative to transition to renewable and resilient energy future. New York City's electricity generation and distribution infrastructure is highly vulnerable to storm surge, flooding, and extreme heat, and we can no longer wait to invest in a just transition. Thank you. 
Um, hello, my name is Lee Zishi. I am an organizer with Sane Energy Project. I am also a documentary filmmaker who has worked with communities that have been, act been impacted by frack gas infrastructure for about six years. Um, I thank the City Council um, so much for being here and listening to us today, and I wish Con Ed would have stayed and done the same. It seems like most of them left after they testified, um, but as I will kind of address in my testimony, that's kind of been the par for the course for us dealing with Con Ed. Um, the Con Ed blackouts during the heat wave and following heavy storms expose a scary truth that our energy infrastructure here in New York is not prepared for climate change. But what's even more terrifying is that Con Ed wants to continue to build out frack gas infrastructure that will only make climate change even worse. In their current rate case, Con Ed is proposing to spend 200 million of our ratepayer dollars to expand frack gas pipelines in Manhattan and Queens, 191 million dollars to expand seven miles of pipeline in the Bronx, and 64 million of our ratepayer dollars to extend the life of an LNG facility in Astoria. That also does not include the money that they're spending to uh, replace leaking pipelines, and very often they're using that as an excuse to actually expand pipelines, which overall will increase emissions when the full life cycle of gas is taken into account, not diminish them um, like they testified today. Climate science is telling us we need to get off gas, but Con Ed doesn't want to listen to climate science or New Yorkers who time and time again have vehemently opposed frack gas. All they care about is locking us into a business model that makes their shareholders obscene profits. Yesterday, at a hearing before the New York State Legislature, Con Ed President Tim Cawley said the rate case has been a very collaborative process. Sane Energy is a party to the rate case, which is currently in confidential settlement, so I can't say much, but I believe the public deserves to know that the proposal on the table completely fails the climate test and that the process has not been collaborative. The room is mostly full of lawyers in suits, and when we've brought up climate science, it's been thrown back at us as how we feel on certain issues. Requests for more public hearings in communities most impacted by fossil fuel pollution and high energy burdens were denied. And even today, we requested that settlement negotiations be rescheduled so small organizations like St. Energy Project could attend this important hearing. Our request was denied, and I felt it was more important to be here today in this room than in that settlement room a couple of blocks away where the voices of people demanding that climate science be listened to have been ignored and even looked down upon. Yesterday, Tim Cawley said four times that Con Edison's customers are their true north, but they don't seem very interested in what I have to say as a ratepayer. I think money is Kali and Con Ed's guiding star. And yesterday, while lying about what a collaborative process this has been, Tim Kali made about $6,777, um, because he's making about $2.4 million a year. So that, you know, over $6,000 is actually more than I have in my bank account right now. Um, I work part-time at St. Energy organizing for a livable future, but I'm also a server at a restaurant. So I work incredibly hard for my money. And to be thinking that Con Ed is not only going to be raising my rates, but that every some of those dollars that I'm sending to them, they're actually going to be spending them on making New York an unlivable city by funding frack gas infrastructure. So how do we get to a truly reliable, safe energy system? Uh, we stop investing in frack gas infrastructure today. We stop giving Con Ed and their CEOs and shareholders million dollar salaries and high rates of return. And we let climate science, not a brutal form of capitalism, determine our energy system. Recently, youth climate activist Greta Thunberg arrived in New York and her message was very simple. It was act now. So Con Ed is proposing a rate plan that's gonna last three years. It's continuing to invest in frack gas infrastructure. We have a very limited amount of time to act and this rate plan does not get us there. So if we continue to follow Con Ed's path, we know heat waves will only get worse. We know the rainstorms will only get stronger and more intense, stressing not just our energy infrastructure, but the entire systems of this city. So we need to act now. And like I said, I felt like it was more important to be here talking to you because I've seen action come from city council. And so I hope you can take this message to a lot of the other members who had to leave 
Um, you know, what Con Ed is proposing right now is just insane. And it's been very difficult to sit there in a room, not be able to talk about what's going on, and just have them, you know, debate about how much money they're going to make while the plan that's on the table is a disaster as for the climate. So again, thank you so much for listening and all the action you've taken already from City Council on climate change. Hello. Uh, my name is Gustavo. I'm with the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. Um, Con Edison's blackouts in July coincided with a heat wave and extreme weather during the hottest month in recorded human history. Look at the devastation wrought this week by Hurricane Dorian, the fifth Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic in the last four years. And it's not hard to see that climate change will be the defining social and economic issue of the next several decades. More and more, voters are seeing this too. In April 2019, a CNN poll found climate change to be the top issue for registered Democrats. 82% of registered voters who identified as Democrats or Democratic-leaning independents listed climate change as a very important top priority they'd like to see get the focus of a presidential debate. In August 2019, a poll conducted by YouGov Blue and commissioned by Data for Progress found that nearly 62% of voters said they'd support a policy holding energy companies or utilities legally liable if it could be proven that they misled the public about the consequences of climate change. This isn't good news for Con Edison. In 2017, the Energy and Policy Institute published a report titled Utilities New, documenting electric utilities' early knowledge and ongoing deception on climate change from 1968 to 2017. The report details that Con Edison contributed funding to produce a 1971 report on the industry's long-term research and development goals that already included research into the effects of CO2. Con Edison is a member of the major trade association, the Edison Electric Institute, which has spent recent years lobbying against solar throughout the country. And today we heard Con Edison's representatives say that they have a lot of power and influence in these organizations. At the Edison, Electric Institute's annual convention in 1971, an MIT professor, Dr. Carol L. Wilson, warned that if a consensus arose that we had to limit or curtail the use of hydrocarbons because of their impact on climate, the implications would be enormous. The Edison Electric Institute sponsored a cutting-edge study between 1985 and 1988, which found that climate change is possible over the next 30 years may significantly affect the electric utility industry. But over 30 years later, investor-owned utilities like Con Edison continue to hold us hostage to ecocidal policy, like expanding fracked gas infrastructure, which Con Edison has supported both with the Williams Pipeline and in its current ongoing rate case, to which we're also parties. And I also want to highlight the what, what I consider to be the illegitimacy of deciding um, a rate increase behind closed doors in a settlement process where none of us are able to disclose in a public way what's going on behind, behind those doors um, or what even the utility wants to propose beyond what's already been outlined in their testimony. So furthermore, in the last months, Con Edison has shown itself to be unable to cope with the extreme weather conditions that they themselves have played a major role in creating and inflicting upon us. I and others in the DSA have spent the last few months talking to New Yorkers about our broken energy system. We canvassed residents in Southeast Brooklyn who spent up to three days lingering in the heat without power during a record-breaking heat wave. That's because Con Edison intentionally cut off power to more than 33,000 homes. These New Yorkers were sacrificed without warning and wanted to know why. Con Ed had 20 minutes between the decision to cut power to Southeast Brooklyn and the actual depowering, but they have no system in place to notify people when they cut off their power. 
Some we spoke to in these neighborhoods, such as in Flatbush, were concerned for their family members and elderly neighbors at risk of heat stroke. One spoke of a diabetic family member in her home who was unable to properly store insulin, putting her health on the line. Some already rent burdened struggled to eat that week because their food spoiled and they were unable to turn on their stoves. Those who took the time to apply, to apply for reimbursement from Con Ed during the short window they were allowed initially found it Byzantine and difficult to navigate, but most reported not knowing reimbursement had been an option at all. One Canarsie resident had her power shut off and was forced to sleep outside on the porch with her baby because it was so hot in their apartment, again, during the hottest month in recorded history. The baby contracted viral conjunctivitis, which cannot be treated with antibiotics, and soon after gave it to the mother, which led to her missing a week of work. It was a chain of misfortune set in motion by Con Ed's greed and well-documented history of placing profits over public safety, grid resilience, social equity, and climate justice. We also spoke to people in Astoria, Queens, where a lion's share of the city's power is generated and where a recent transformer fire turned the night sky a vivid blue, leaving community members asking themselves if they were actually safe in their own neighborhood. More than 100 people made it out to a town hall council member Constantinides hosted with us in Astoria to speak out against Con Ed, despite the pouring rain. Throughout that town hall and through canvassing, we have found that people are fed up with Con Ed and want real change. The climate crisis is upon us, and it's time we prioritize a just transition to renewable energy over investors' profits. We face two massive intersecting crises of climate change and debilitating economic inequality. There's no rationalizing why we let a corporate entity like Con Ed, who has shown no meaningful sign of being willing to confront the climate crisis, profit by mismanaging a critical public resource like our city's energy. There is mass support for an energy system that is publicly owned and accountable to the people, not shareholders. This is nothing new. Public takeovers of utilities can and have been done many times before. The entire state of Nebraska runs fully off of public power after the state expelled its for-profit utility for charging exploitative rates. Additionally, more than 2,000 cities in the United States operate publicly owned utilities and actually see the money from these utilities go straight back into their communities rather than disappear into the pockets of shareholders and CEOs. Last year, Con Edison paid almost $850 million in shareholder dividends and made over $1 billion in profits. Those profits should be democratically controlled by New Yorkers, the very people who provided them. It has been made clear that Con Ed's infrastructure is not ready for the coming century of climate crisis and their business model isn't either. Thankfully, there is an alternative. We don't have to rely on a corporate monopoly to provide clean energy. We don't have to wait to save our, profit, our planet until it becomes profitable for investors. We can take ma matters into our own hands by creating a publicly owned and democratically controlled utility instead. We could decommodify clean energy and guarantee it to all New Yorkers as a human right, much in the same way we guarantee clean water through our public water utility. We already have the largest state-owned public utility in the US, the New York Power Authority, which was founded during the New Deal. We could expand NIPA or municipalize private utilities like Con Ed and National Grid to decarbonize, decommodify, and decarbonize our energy system. On average, publicly owned utilities are 15% more affordable, more reliable, with outage durations less than half the national average, more sustainable and safer than privately owned utilities. Publicly owned utilities contributions to state and local governments are on average 33% higher than those of investor owned utilities. And success stories like Austin Energy, the Kit Carson Electric Cooperative in New Mexico, which have set some of the most ambitious renewable targets in the country, will give us a solid roadmap to work from. Publicly owned utilities are not a radical idea. Public or municipal utilities already serve 30% of all electricity customers in the US. What's radical is continu continuing to let Con Ed profit from killing us and our planet. Con Ed has passed the costs of their outdated and dangerous business model onto ratepayers, taxpayers, workers, and the environment for too long. It is long past time for the rest of us to wake up and propose a different way forward. 
It's time that we bring the billions in profits under democratic control to invest in the renewable energy future we need to survive. Hi, everybody. My name is Kim Frachek. I'm the director of Sane Energy Project. Um, we represent <clears throat> over 8,500 New Yorkers working for the past decade toward halting fossil fuels and moving our economy to 100% renewable, owned and led renew uh, renewables. Um, thank you for hosting this crucial hearing today. Um, I also uh, am joined by my, my colleague Lee Zishi and, and Lisa Harrison. Um, we are parties to the Con Ed rate case and we chose to come here today instead of um, a settlement meeting where we clearly have no voice. Um, they do not um, have any, um, any means to consider our recommendations or anything. So we appreciate the fact that you actually listen to us and implement the change and you carry the same vibrancy toward demanding from our systems as we do, so thank you very much. Um, after reviewing the legislative hearing yesterday with Consolidated Edison, it's clear that we have a rogue company monopolizing our lives and we should sculpt a plan of what New York City looks like with publicly owned energy systems, one where localized renewable energy systems can flourish, be funded, accessible, and equitable. It's time for us to vision the world that we want, and, and those people in this room right now are part of making that process happen. It's not an easy task, but we should begin uh, the visioning process to make it a reality and work together with those who have already put forward incredible visions and technology to pass climate laws in the state that we just saw this past legislative session. The money and the technology are there, and we need to get it. Uh, yet we have powers working against us now that are willing to fight to the death to maintain the system that works for the billionaire and millionaire class. Um, I just want to identify that Con Ed said in their, in their hearing today that now they're working with the Public Service Commission to try to own generation. Um, and that already goes against the law because they are a monopoly. But at the same time, they want to own this generation and they're appealing to, to do so, so we can move to renewables. They're, they're lobbying to, to squash community solar at the same exact time. So they basically want to squash any community drive to build renewables in our own communities until they can mandate that they own the power and the generation and the distribution and maintain their monopoly status so they can own the renewable revolution. Um, right now, Con Ed is asking for another rate hike to expand more fossil fuels, as other people have pointed out. And they want to stuff their shareholder pockets by cutting corners on us, the people of New York City. A note that Con Ed CEO John McAvoy cashes in, making $4,200 per hour, and President Tim Cawley, $1,150 per hour, per hour. The good people of New York City fought with all their might to get $15 an hour, just to put things in perspective. Tim Cawley's gross response to the blackouts in the hearing yesterday was that the company sent apology letters to the people of New York and that the current rate case is collaborative. Sane Energy Project being a party to the case, to the current case, I can assure you it is anything but in collaborative, inclusive, or democratic. And Tim didn't even have the respect for the, our New York City Council to show up today at this crucial hearing. Regarding the blackouts, let's put on record that Con Ed did not use the funds from their last rate hike case to address grid dependability by funding a relay, pro relay protection system, the very parts of the grid responsible for the blackouts. And to add insult to injury, they then selected neighborhoods to blackout during the heat wave. We have the answers. The answers is to redistribute the wealth and power away from these billionaires pumping fossil fuels into our city on our dime while letting our systems go into disrepair. Although renewables and efficiency conservation undermine Con Ed's profit, it will keep us safe, so it's time to fight for that. We support City Council's leadership on accountability to the corporate utilities in New York City, and we additionally urge the City Council to hold another hearing, continue to make statements and actions with us against National Grid's scare tactics, and holding businesses and residents hostage to push through the williams nessie pipeline. We urge you to make a direct demand to John Rhodes at the Public Service Commission to do his job and serve the public by standing up to the criminal acts of corporate utilities. 
when I had conversations with Catherine McCarran and John Rhodes at the Public Service Commission recently, they told, when I asked them where the, where the investigation was on Con Edison's moratorium, and now they're opening an investigation on National Grid's moratorium, and I said, when are they gonna be ready? Then the Con Ed investigation was supposed to be due in June, and they, my, the answer from Catherine McCarran, who's in charge of gas at the PSC, wrote me back and said, it'll be ready when it's ready. That is not the kind of answer that I expect from my state agencies that I pay their bills. So, you know, we should really, I would love for the city council to make uh, a concerted demand to the Public Service Commission. We are all showing up at their meeting on September 19th in Albany because they're gonna be issuing energy efficiency standards mandated to the, um, to the um, to the pub, to the utilities, so we're going to be running a, a letter to the editors campaign leading up to that meeting, which is going to be commencement of the climate strike week. So we would love um, to speak with all of you about issuing letters to the editor to the Public Service Commission to demand that they make our public utilities work for us because they're the regulators. This is their job. Um, we know that we can't rely on the corporate utilities to be an honest voice in this renewable transition. Why would John McAvoy and Tim Cawley want anything to change? The slanted system is working just fine for them. And the power dynamic trickles down to other executives in Con Ed, like we just saw the people sitting here today. Those same people were sitting at this very table on April 15th, 2019, in the hearing to pass the resolution to oppose the williams Nessie pipeline. Consolidated Edison representatives, Ivan Kimball, the VP of Energy Management, and, and Kyle Kimball, the VP of Government, Regional, and Community Affairs, claiming that methane gas supply constraints in New York City to justify building another heinous pipeline in order to bring profit to none other than Williams, Con Edison, and National Grid shareholders, and stick all of us footing the bill. Their testimony was counter to a report issued by Suzanne Mate, former DEC regional director, that we don't even need the gas. Further, they continued to say, they didn't do it today, so they learned, but they did say in that April 15th hearing, and I watched the video to confirm, fracked gas was, quote, renewable gas several times in their testimony, and they had no plan for renewables other than waiting for the market to work first when asked by Speaker Johnson. We can't afford to keep business as usual when business as usual is killing us. We need accountability and redistribution of wealth power, and starting with the corporate utilities that operate in New York. Um, I'll, I'll email you all my testimony. I, I just didn't have the opportunity to print it this morning. Thank you so much. No, thank you all for your testimony and for shedding light on all of the issues of Con Ed and especially in our communities of color. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Going to call up our, our final pa uh, panel. We have Lisa Harrison and Greg Waltman. Lisa Harrison and Greg Waltman. You may begin. Just remember to uh, state your name before you give your testimony. I'm Lisa Harrison. I um, live in the Upper West Side, Manhattan, and I am a volunteer with Sane Energy. Um, so for as long as I can remember, no blackout has been caused by lack of fuel. They've always been due to a problem in the distribution system. Distributing power is Con Edison's one job. <clears throat> I would like to see major improvements in the distribution system before Con Edison gets into the energy generation business. Public utilities are granted monopoly status for practical reasons, and the public is divvied up among the various utilities. For the privilege of having monopoly status, the utilities are regulated. Unfortunately, the regulation part is not working very well. Con Ed has been granted multiple rate increases, which it claimed were needed to improve the system. 
For example, it previously proposed the Relay Protection System Redundancy Program, projected to cost $350 million. After raising the rates, Con Ed scrapped the program. Did anyone get a refund for that? I didn't. As it turns out, the recent blackout on the west side of Manhattan was caused by a faulty relay protection system. Then, then about a week later, as we've heard, uh, Con Ed managed their system load by cutting off power to 50,000 customers in Brooklyn during the heat wave. Con Ed is now asking for another rate increase. This time, they want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to expand fracked gas infrastructure, locking us into decades more of fracked gas and forcing us to pay for it. Instead of maintaining Con Ed's business model, we should be increasing energy efficiency and transitioning to 100% renewable energy. A public utility would be helping with this effort, not taking us in the opposite direction. Instead of pipelines, we need aggressive efficiency programs and incentives for replacing archaic boilers with ground and air source heat pumps, which will eventually run on wind, solar, and tidal, tidal electricity. I just wanted to say a little bit also about the smart meters, um, which we heard great praise for from Con Edison. Um, scientists and healthcare professionals are concerned about the health impacts of smart meters and the radiation that they admit, emit. But this hasn't stopped Con Ed from installing them all over our city. Shouldn't the company have to prove that their product is safe before rolling it out? When did it become okay to use the public as guinea pigs? And especially in New York City, where we're not talking about a single family house with one meter, we're talking about huge apartment buildings with rows of meters in, in their basements. I got this um, large postcard from Con Edison with a smiling guy saying, smart meters are coming and it gave a, a phone number for uh, if you have any questions. Uh, I called that number, and I found, um, I had several questions, I, one of them was answered, which was, um, I said, can I opt out of this program? They said, I can opt out if I pay $9.50 a month, which amounts to about $1,000 a year. And they said that was because they will have to send someone to read the meter, as they do currently. So I said, okay, um, my building has 10 apartments in it. If the whole building opts out, would that be 950 for the building since you're only sending one person to read the meter, not 10 people to read each meter? And she said, no, uh, it's 950 per account because that's what the PFP, um, Public Service Commission, PSC, approved. So, uh, you know, I said, well, that doesn't seem very fair. And she said, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I had some questions about the meters because I'm not a scientist. I don't really know if they're safe. I don't feel comfortable just taking Con Ed's word for it saying, yeah, they're fine. Um, you trust us. So uh, I've tried to get some answers. The person I spoke to had no information on the smart meter. She said to call the manufacturer, which was a Clara. I called a Clara. I did not get information from them either. So I, I have a list of questions that I would like to get answered. If you have any um, influence with, you know, with them, I would love to give them to you and see if you can get answers, because I can't make an informed decision yeah, on this. After the hearing, we, we can uh, have a side conversation. That would be great. Questions. Yeah, right, thank that would, you. That would be great. Appreciate it. So, um, you know, Con Ed operates as a for-profit monopoly corporation accountable to its stockholders, not to the public. Their decisions are made on the basis of profits. Um, they do not consider the environmental impact of their decisions, only their bottom line. Con Ed is desperate to preserve their business model and keep us hooked on fossil fuel, as was made clear by their fake gas shortage and moratorium and lobbying for the Williams Pipeline, which they have been doing, as people have mentioned. Obviously, the system is not working. 
A better option might be municipal utilities using only renewable energy. Since Con Ed clearly will not change its business model, we need a public solution to this. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, City Council. My name is Greg Waltman. Um, here testifying on behalf of G1 Quantum, my energy company. We've been at this issue for quite many, many months now, but um, although I am appeased by today's uh, schedule of having Cod Edison and energy being discussed, I'm not ignorant to the council using it to redirect Jamie Dimon's proximity to Jeffrey Epstein and that in relation to the Bernard Madoff type of issue that I brought to the council's attention as I was there before Harry Markopoulos, which you have the email. So going back to energy, um, you know, energy generation, like I said, I submitted superior bid on the border wall to put solar panels on the border wall in energy generation. Now, these contracts could be originated from New York and then offset any type of fiscal and budgetary concerns that the council might have. So are we gonna sit here, like Chair Constantinidis said, in, in an illusion of choice, or are we actually gonna do something? And, and that's why what I'm here to do. I mean, you have an illusion of choice with your improperly formed monopoly utility at Con Edison, but if you were to cut me a blank check today, I wouldn't be able to tell you that I'd be able to do a better job reworking infrastructure because you're gonna have power outages. That's just the way it is. But how, how we address an offset or, or um, how can you talk about a rate increase under those types of conditions, and I just don't think a rate cre increase is warranted under those types of conditions. It's, it's not that you need more competitors in the marketplace, it, it's just that you need to rethink about how you offset or address or generate tax revenues in, in, in the type of way that I just described, a solar application on the wall. I mean, it, you, you might not like the wall, but if it's gonna be there and has been there for over 100 years, it might as well produce energy. Then you stabilize an economy like a Tijuana demonstrating application, and you create the type of reciprocity you need, not only stabilizing energy prices in North America, but also Latin America, so you have the type of opportunity in Latin America that we have here in America, right? So if you create the similar opportunity, you resolve chain migratory issues, essentially killing, you know, a couple value birds with one stone. Um, and, and, and it's not only that, it's, you know, you look at Hudson Yards and you see trains clunking out tens of thousands of dollars in diesel an hour just sitting there. Anyone notice that? They just clunk out diesel not doing anything, just stationary, spending money on stationary. While, you know, New Yorkers are now being forced to, to buy single ride tickets on the MTA. Is that because the price of diesel is going up soon? I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things where there's just a, a lack of accountability across the board. And, and for the governor and to write checks to uh, different types of county officials, m municipalities to do LIRR track uh, enhancements while overlooking quantum tracks in the clean energy application like I described many times, and reapplication of speed breaker technology is just absurd. So I just, I just hope that some of these issues, you know, are addressed and, and we parse through the value Green New Deal illusion of choice narratives that Chair Constantinides was alluding to. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, with that said, uh, we're concluding this hearing. Um, I appreciate everyone for their testimony. Uh, we will uh, go back and review everything that was said today and see what is the best way for the council to move forward and find ways we can continue holding Con Ed accountable. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.